It's a bad beatboxing hour with Sam and Connor. Oops, it's Katsubutsu Kibabadu. Yeah. 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 This has been beatboxing, bad beatboxing hour with Sam and Connor. Hour? Oh, f- yeah, I have to do that hour. for. You have to do that for an hour. Wow. Um, that's a lot right now. Mm. But so you just kind of want to do our regular thing? I'm sure. All right. Well, you know, it's been it's been. I'm I'm exhausted right now. You look tired. <laughs> I'm very tired. It was one of those like I went. I left a little bit early to go to the gym, and that yes, I'm working out and. I, I was doing. I was working some new parts of the old of the old mm, system of the anatomy of the trunk of the body, if you will, the core. And uh, it is painful to sit upright now. In addition to the fact that we streamed all night, well, not all night, but we streamed into the late hours of the evening. We even cut it a little early last night. Did we? We did. It was a little, well, it was a little bit before like eleven. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Monday night streams, of course, on TikTok where we play Magic the Gathering. We also probably uh, should figure out a way to set up to just do YouTube and TikTok at the same time. Problem is TikTok won't give us a fucking stream key hmm. because their their ways are and it's it's one of those like you could to get TikTok to do anything as a creator. You kind of just have to shout out into the void. Yeah. And then hope that some deity answers. Yeah. Choose a god and pray to it. Yeah. Really. Um, and the thing is, is you can pick your god. You can pick someone else's god. Yeah. Uh, to TikTok, they're both fucking wrong. <laughs> so good luck with that in mind. Um, this is not a t- this is not a they're not a TikTok. This is not a TikTok. This is a podcast. It, it is. is not a podcast about TikTok. It is about, of course. The Dungeons of the Dragons. It's the Dungeon Bros podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And today we have a very special sponsor, of course. Uh, second second sponsor of the Dungeon Bros podcast, uh, Beholder Beans. Mm-hmm. Little baby Beholder Beans. Now you might be familiar with the pinto beans, the black beans, the red beans. These are not the kind of beans. No, nope. these aren't kidney beans or lima no. beans or green beans. Much much unknown about uh, the Beholder anatomy is that on the under on the undercarriage of the ball that is the beholder uh they actually have like little paws and little little beans little bean pads if you've ever seen a beholder that's tired and and wanting to rest from all of the floating and they rest upon a glass table and you look from underneath the table you got like these perfect little beholder beans yes so yeah second sponsor ever is the beholder beans uh uh, boil them mash them eat them Stick them in a stew? St- I don't want to stew any beans, personally. Stewed beans is like a thing, though. Yeah. Uh, just remember, the next time you slay a beholder and you're trying to, to loot the corpse as yes. it is for valuable bits, don't forget the beholder beans. Don't forget the beholder beans. Uh, use code Dungeon Bros at checkout for 20% off your next order of beholder beans. One thing you actually can buy <laughs> is uh, we have merch. It's exciting. It is exciting. It's we new. we didn't mention it at all in the live stream last night. I realize that now. That's okay. But uh, we have not actually physically seen the merch. We just kind of set up the merch store on Stream Elements. Uh, you can check the link in the link tree in the bio for all of the social medias for it. But we've ordered some of the merch for ourselves to try out. So once we have done that, we can give a qualitative assessment. What I can say is that based on the renderings from the website, it looks like it's going to be pretty all right. And yeah. from what I've heard anecdotally from other people that have used Stream Elements merch store in the past, uh, they have fairly good quality yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, we lowered the price on it a little bit just because uh, we want more people to have them. So check that out if you want. There's some stickers, some shirts, some zip-up hoodies. We have some other art on the way for... Once we get that, we'll add more. We'll add more. Add more. All that kind of stuff. Just continuously until there's an ungodly amount of merch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I as I was telling Sam last night, I would love to have the fleece shorts. Mm. The fleece shorts. I have a pair with that I got from Walmart with Naruto on them. And he's eating ramen. And I would like that, but with a big old fat DB on it. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Maybe, maybe a... Uh, Sensor here because we haven't really said what the new art is going to be, but our friend Chris is working on it. And yes. it's a little, it's a very cute little thing. Maybe that on a right on a leg on a short. Or we write Dungeon Bros across the butt, Ooh. just like those you know two thousand nine juicy pants. Ooh, that's a that's a fucking great idea. Honestly, um, the last little bit of before we because we got 
There's a lot of news. We got a lot of news. Really, it's only two major news items, but there's a lot contained within them. They're thick. They're very, they're very chunk. Uh, but the last little housekeeping thing: we are going to Gen Con in Indianapolis in August, and uh, the Gen Con events are available to view and add to your wish list now. You add them to your wish list. You rank them by uh, what you find most important to get mm-hmm. tickets for, and uh, beginning on Mar- on May twenty first. Uh, registration is going to open. If you have your wish list, you can submit your wish list, and then you'll get tickets rank ordered. So, you know, if something's like your 10th most important thing, you might not get in it if it's a crowded event, but if you're first, you might be more likely it's a whole. I don't know. I don't know the mysteries of their algorithm on the back end. But at the same time, from what we experienced last year, it's not too hard to get into most, to most things, even if you're a little late. Yeah. So, you know, it's not college classes. Don't don't kill wake yourself. Up at, yeah. Don't wake up at 2 a.m. when they open to get in your classes like I had to do. It was not fun. My senior year it was great. I got to do it at like noon. There you go. <laughs> but if you're in, if you were not a senior, you because seniors got to pick classes oh, yeah, a week a week before, mm-hmm. and the opening for that was noon instead of two in the morning. Why they chose to do that on a school night? I don't. I don't know. I have I, no idea. I was a chemistry major in college, and uh, basically there were fifteen of us taking any class, and there were thirty seats always. So for fuck's sake, that is unnecessary. <laughs> that is an unnecessary amount. Of- once, once I got to higher, of course, like my lower level courses were always like the three hundred lecture seat, seat lecture halls. Yeah. But yeah, my upper level courses were all like these tiny little classrooms or labs that were never full because there were only fifteen of us doing the thing at a time. Yeah, that that check out. I mean, I was in I was in media classes, so like we other than the media history like one hundred two class that we had to take, like every every media major had to take that course their freshman year. That was a class of like a hundred, uh, but everything else it was like under twenty five. Yeah. It was pretty sweet. Uh, we're just going to run through the upcoming releases for Dungeons & Dragons and Magic the Gathering, as we do every week, to make sure that you stay updated. Big B Presents, The Glory of Giants, as well as the Fandelver campaign book that does not have an official title yet, will be in quarter three of 2023. Uh, the Book of Many Things, as well as the Planescape campaign, is going to be quarter four, 2023. That's four books for the second half of 2023. Yeah. I feel like a couple of them are going to get delayed. Or... Put on the chopping block. Yeah, I, I, if uh, we going back a couple weeks, even uh, we had these these as some of them were supposed to be. They were more spaced out, but it seems like whatever uh, Wizards of the Coast is doing, as they did last year, just crunching everything down. Whether that's due to time constraints or uh, resource constraints. But. Yeah, they they are also probably wanting their products to move away from their big controversies recently. Also true. I mean, yeah, they did put out uh, like uh, Dragonlance, which we have in front of us, as well as uh, the uh, oh heist book, the, the yes. golden keys from the Golden Vault, which kind yeah. of gl- glossed over due to their dumb stuff. Yeah, I, I also do. You think this might be indicative of like uh, maybe they're going to delay one D and D's release a little bit from like the beginning of twenty twenty four to like the end of twenty twenty four? I give could room see that for another happening. book or two. I could see that happening for sure. For sure. For uh, Magic the Gathering, March of the Machines is currently out. It's it's been out for a little while. March of the Machines Aftermath is going to be coming out this Friday as of a recording of this podcast. If you're watching it on the first day that it posts on Wednesday, May 10th, that is in two days, is March of the Machines Aftermath. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it. Buy the singles if you find some singles mm-hmm. that you like. Uh, the Lord of the Rings set is going to be released on June 23rd, and then another supplementary Lord of the Rings set in November, November 3rd. Commander Masters is going to be August 4th. The Wilds of Eldraine, we know pre-release is going to be September 1st, and September 8th is going to be the official launch. We know that for sure now. Uh, the Doctor Who Commander decks, October 13th, and The Lost Caverns of Ixalan in November of 2023. Those are all the upcoming releases from Wizards of the Coast. Let's get into the big one. Yeah. <laughs> we got one D&D, the biggest playtest material they've ever released, ever, is playtest number five, Player's Handbook, on Earth Arcana 2023. is 50 pages, 5-0, of playtest material. Inside, you've got the Barbarian, the Fighter, the Sorcerer, the Warlock, the Wizard, new spells that are specific to them, to the Spellcasters, of course, Mm -hmm. weapons and weapon mastery, some updates to feats as well. So we got got a lot to go through. Uh, We normally go through feature by feature. We're probably going to rush through some things because there is just so much, and we don't want to make a three-hour podcast. That's true. 
One thing that they have added that is a wonderful thing for people like us, as well as people that have been watch like reading these play tests and are trying to remember what has changed, they've added a design notes section for all the major changes that they've made to each section. So the first section they have is weapons. This is probably the most exciting thing, the most exciting addition. Obviously, the class updates are always neat, and some people are going to like, some people are not. I think this is going to be a net pretty much everyone likes. Mm -hmm. Like, th this is just a buff to all martial weapons. But, design note, weapon updates. Each weapon now has a mastery property, a special property that requires a feature to unlock. The mastery properties are going to be described later. Short sword has been moved to being a martial weapon again. The net, which does not deal damage, is now adventuring gear rather than a weapon. Uh, the trident's damage die has changed from a d6 to a d8, and its versatile die is now a d10 rather than a d8. The lance has the heavy and two-handed properties rather than a special property, which previously imposed disadvantage on some of its attack rolls, and its damage dice has been changed from a d12 to a d10. The war pick now has the versatile property. The musket and the pistol, which previously were in the Dungeon Master's Guide, are now available as martial weapons in that are ranged, uh, and as always, the DM chooses whether or not they are going to be available. Uh, the light weapon property now appears in the weapons property section rather than in the glossary. <laughs> Fair. And the thrown weapon property now allows you to draw a weapon as part of the ranged attack. Just kind of a nice quality of life, really kind of should have been there always kind of feature. So some minor changes. Uh, a lot of weapons now, there, there's several weapons that now have the versatile property for D8 to D10, the battle axe, the long sword, the war pick, and the war hammer. Now all are D8 weapons. Uh, the battle axe being slashing, the long sword being slashing. Uh, both of them are versatile to 1D10, making them seemingly exactly the same. Why would you pick one over the other? Well, now they have mastery properties. Mm -hmm. Every single weapon has a mastery property. We'll get into that in a moment. What do you think of the just kind of these base changes that they've been making to the weapons so far? Uh, so, I mean, previously, uh, that was always a concern, you know, a, a complaint I personally had, as well as a lot of other people, um, which was the weapons have no purpose. Uh, uh, you know, you would just choose basically, unless you're going flavor flavor wise, you just choose the one that did the most damage in the 2014 edition um so a lot of these that you know if they're changing properties or they're changing damage die uh it's kind of all bring everything in line but as you were saying this mastery property that they've added to each one this is the the big the big one this is yeah. the, the one that is going to add uh, mechanical purpose to choosing a different weapon. Yes. Now, a lot of these weapons, uh, for example, the only ones that seemingly are exactly the same from what I can tell, uh, the longsword and the battle axe, 1d8 slashing, versatile 1d10, they do have different mastery properties, whereas the other d8 to d10 versatile weapons are piercing and bludgeoning damage, despite having the same mastery property as the longsword. We'll get into those right now. There are several varieties of mastery properties. Cleave. These are for melee weapons that have the heavy property, generally. If you hit a creature with a melee attack using this weapon, you can make an attack roll with a weapon with the weapon against a second creature within five feet of the first that is also within your reach. On the hit, the second creature takes the weapon's damage, but you don't add your ability modifier to that damage unless the modifier is negative. You can make this extra attack only once per turn. So, kind of that... that visual of like having this massive weapon that just slices through and then into someone else and much like the previous uh light weapon property where the that little extra bonus attack mm -hmm. doesn't have the modifier attached to it so you're just getting an extra free attack if you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies flex is for weapons with the versatile property when you hit with a melee weapon uh, with a melee weapon attack using this weapon you deal its versatile damage even if you're wielding it with one hand. So the long sword can now deal 1d10 if you have a sword and board. Mm -hmm. Graze, melee weapons with the heavy property. If your attack roll with this weapon misses a creature, you can deal damage to that creature equal to the ability modifier you use to make the attack roll. The damage is the same type dealt by the weapon. The damage can't be increased in any way other than increasing the ability modifier. 
So the reason for that little stipulation, grays is you miss, but you still kind of nick them a little bit. And they add the stipulation is because you are still missing them with the attack, you can't be like, ooh, I'm going to graze them and then smite on top of it right. or something. Uh, Nick is for weapons with the light property. When you make an ex- when you make the extra attack of the light property, you can make it as part of the attack action instead of as a bonus action, and you can still only make this extra attack once per turn. So just freeing up your bonus action as a dual wielder. Push for heavy two-handed or versatile property weapons. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can push the creature up to 10 feet away from you if it is no more than one size larger than you. You could do some shenanigans with that. Like pushing, like I've seen some people thinking that you can technically push them up. Mm. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. Uh, sap requires the prerequisite is no other weapon properties. If you hit a creature with this weapon, that creature has disadvantage on its next attack roll before you start your next turn. Slow, there is no prerequisite for what weapon can have this. If you hit a creature with this weapon and deal damage to the creature, you can reduce its speed by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. If you hit the creature more than once with this property, the speed reduction does not exceed 10 feet. Topple is for weapons with the heavy reach or versatile properties. If you hit a creature with this weapon, you can force the creature to make a constitution saving throw with a DC equal to 8, plus your proficiency, plus your ability modifier uh, you use to make the attack roll. On a failed save, the creature has the prone condition. And then lastly, Vex, the prerequisites are uh, ammunition, finesse, or the light property. If you hit a creature with the weapon and deal damage to the creature, you have advantage on the next attack roll against that creature before the end of your next turn. It is advantage on your next attack roll, not just anybody's. Um, A lot to take in there. Some examples of what weapons are paired with what. The dagger has Nick. So if you miss, or no, yeah, the dagger has Nick. (laughs) I was confusing it with Gray's. Nick, so you can make that bonus, the light weapon bonus action attack as part of the same action, freeing up your bonus action. Really good for the rogue. Uh, The great club has push, being able to move. Um, A lot of the the ranged weapons, the dart, the short bow, uh, the blow gun, the hand crossbow, and the pistol all have Vex, giving advantage on your next attack. Uh, the longbow has slow. Musket has slow. Uh, the long sword, uh, the long sword, the war hammer, and the war pick are all the versatile weapons that have flex. Battle axe has the same damage type as the long sword. It has topple instead. Uh, you can go through the entire list if you want. There's a lot of interesting combinations here. Uh, what, what do you think of certain weapon combinations of the specific uh, uh, mastery properties? Like what's standing out to you? So the mastery properties in general, uh, it, it's good. Well, in my opinion, it's going to really help. At, uh, for one, the martial classes that are going to get uh, you know immediate or uh, expanded access to these, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to some of the other uh, classes. Where again, in the 2014 version, you know, just because you're a fighter doesn't mean you have any more proficiency with a long sword than you know. Uh, the wizard who dipped a little into something else. But yeah. adding this now uh, gives a lot more interest to that and giving reason to take the weapon expert. Yes. Um, depending on what your build is. I think, I mean, uh, the, the the Vex is always, you know, the if you hit a creature with this weapon, it deals damage to this creature. You have advantage on the next attack roll against the creature before the end of your next turn. That's going to be very powerful, especially like you were saying, um, for like rogues or for yeah. like, uh, you know, anybody really. Ro- a rogue's best friend is probably going to be the hand axe. 1d6 slashing, light weapon. So you can make two attacks with it, even though the rogue doesn't get extra attack. Uh, and it has vex. So mm-hmm. if you hit with the first one, you get automatic advantage on the second one, giving you an automatic trigger of your sneak attack if you hit with the second attack. But yeah, other than that, I mean, the. the uh, what this is, is kind of layering on a little just a little tiny chunk of the spell casting system onto the weapons mm-hmm. um which uh you know at, it, 
it can be it can be ignored. This, the mastery properties can be ignored uh, for newer players or players who aren't very interested in diving deeper. But for those players who do want to optimize and or just have more use with their character in combat, these are a great option. It's it's really good for the war gamer minded, the combat strategy minded player for sure. Um, we have oh. Why did my browser do that? That was annoying. Uh, we do have one question from the Discord. Uh, if you go to our Discord server, you can go to the podcast submissions. Our good friend DK Alexander uh, has been a- asked how we feel about the new weapon mastery. He specifically thinks uh, he was not a big fan of 1 D&D at first, but the weapon masteries and then also the changes to the Warlock and the Wizard, which we'll get to later, have completely changed his mind and thinks they are absolutely fantastic mechanics, hmm. all said and told. I'm inclined to agree with him when it comes to the weapon mastery specifically. We'll get into the details of uh, the wizard and the warlock. I'm inclined to believe that the wizard is also pretty good. I am not entirely sold on the warlock yet, but we'll get to that. I think weapon masteries are a massive step in the right direction for marshals. I still think that on just a pure damage output level, once you get past level five, they're still going to be lacking quite a bit. Uh, And they're still going to need some kind of feat that can replace the old sharpshooter and great great weapon master to kind of increase their damage Mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, But these are absolutely, all of these weapon masteries are, I think, useful. None of them, none of them are worthless. I mean, not being knocked prone, having your speed reduced, uh, pushing them away from you, dealing damage when you miss. I mean, they're all, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I would love them to see go see them go just a little bit farther. Sure, I think. Do you have anything else? I mean, I'm, uh, this is also something we could see them adding more to in further, mm-hmm. more options. Everything's sort mm-hmm. of, and uh, you know, because obviously, like Tosh's Cauldron of Everything is Anathar's and the Anathar's Guide to Everything. They often add more options, especially for spellcasters getting new spells. I mean, you can now now we can actually have maybe even a, a little warriors uh, mm-hmm. somebody somebody who's a warriors guide to stabbing people better. Yeah, the warriors guide to stabbing everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I could even see them going and being like, "Look, you can when you maybe adding." Mul- we'll get into the fighter a little bit later. The fighter is going to be able to swap weapon masteries for mm-hmm. for their weapons that they're proficient with, but. I could see them in the future being like, look, the longsword can have flex, but it also can have Nick, or it could have something else. You know, Nick is a bad example because that's a light uh, that's a light weapon thing. But uh, being a- being able to have multiple options for all the weapons, new options that you can choose to replace the current options for weapon masteries, all that kind of stuff. New weapons in general, always a good thing. Awesome, awesome stuff. The next section is spells. Uh, We're not going to really linger on spells very much. We do get full spell lists, uh, a full arcane spell list, but we are not going to get into all of the details of the spells because most of these spells are tied to features for the Sorcerer, the Warlock, and the Wizard, so we'll get to them as they come up. The main thing, uh, there are 11 new spells here which are connected to the Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard. Uh, the Chaos Bolt spell has been moved over from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and all sorcerers get Chaos Bolt as a bonus spell for free. Eldritch Blast is a cantrip that scales only with your Warlock level now and not your player level, and it is only available to Warlocks, but they all get it as a bonus spell. Hex, uh, is a sp- the spell will deal extra damage only once per turn, a little bit A little bit of a debuff. I don't know why they chose to do that, but all Warlocks get it as a bonus spell, so it doesn't count against the number of spells they know. Um, Other than that, those spells remain unchanged. Hex, of course, only being able to deal the 1d6 necrotic damage once per turn instead of on every hit, which is a bit of a downside, but we'll get into the rest of the spells later. Next, we have the feats. They wanted to note that the epic boon feats that we've been seeing, the level 20 feats that are replacing the capstone level abilities for all of the classes, um, most of the requests that they've received are for them to be more epic. And they agree that they could use more, quote, pizzazz. Yes. <laughs> A lot of them before have been, uh, that we've seen in the past couple playtests, have been like, man, now... Very basic. Very basic. Like, 
you know, a lot of classes pre in the 2014 of it, edition of, of, of D&D 5e were uh, very un- underwhelming. Okay, they bumped those back to level uh, 18. Now we have an epic boon. We thought this is a really good, uh, really good change first up. And then we started looking at the epic boons. We're like, I, I wouldn't care if I got to level 20. I'd be like, I guess I'll That's take neat. this one. Yeah. But yeah, to make it so they really do need to up the epicness in order to make it feel worthy of getting to level 20. Yes. And along those lines, they've included several of them available, and they're going to include new ones. Uh, the epic boon of dimensional travel is available to experts or mage group classes. You get to increase your dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma by one up to a maximum of 30. And then blink steps immediately after you take the attack action or the magic action. You can teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. So just a free misty step every single time you take an attack or magic action. Uh, The boon of energy resistance, expert or mage group classes, increase your con, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma by one up to 30. You gain resistance to two of the following damage types, acid, cold, fire, lightning, necrotic, poison, psychic, radiant, or thunder. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can change them. And when you take damage of a type that you have resistance, you can use your reaction to direct damage of the same type toward another creature you can see within 60 feet of yourself that isn't behind total cover. If you do so, that creature must make a dexterity saving throw, DC equals to eight, plus your proficiency, plus the ability modifier of the score increased by this feat, or they take 2d12 plus your constitution modifier in damage. I'm surprised that the plus isn't the 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 ability that's attached to the speed as well. Yeah. But, again, you get two free resistances to damage types that you can change every single day. And then an extra reaction damage dealing ability if you take down. If you know you're going against a blue dragon, you can take resistance to lightning damage. And then also redirect its lightning at one of its minions. Yeah. I think that's that's pretty cool. The Epic Boon of Irresistible Offense is available to the Expert or Warrior group classes. You can increase your strength or dexterity by 1 up to 30. The bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage you deal always ignores resistance. By the point you're at level 20, you should have a magic weapon. Yeah, probably. That's on your DM. Overwhelming Strike. When you roll a 20 on the D20 for an attack roll, you can deal extra damage to the target equal to the ability score increased by this feat. The extra damages type is the same as the weapon's attack. You can use the benefit only once per turn. If you have a 20 in Strength... And you upped it to 21 with this feat. That means if you roll a crit, you are dealing a flat extra 21 damage. Yeah. A little... Nice, nice 5% chance of happening. You know. Depending. I mean, you know, there are some ways to they can make it more. Yeah. By, the, by, like, the fighter. Well, it's it specifically says when you roll a 20 on the d20. Oh, that's true. Not a crit, but a d20. A exactly. If you, if, it's, if you score if you a critical, critical hit... That would be different. That would be a little bit different if you're a champion fighter. Sorry. Shut up your phone. Stop stop, rece- stop receiving messages and alerts it's, it's, from the internet. How dare you? Yeah, I know. It's not even something I care about. How dare you? I mean, I don't really care much about anything. Except 1 D&D. Uh, the Epic Boon of Recovery is available to all classes. Increase your constitution by 1 up to a maximum of 30. Last stand, if you would be reduced to 0 hit points, you can drop to 1 instead and regain a number of hit points equal to half your hit point maximum. Once you use the benefit, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest, as well as Death Defiant. When you take damage when you have 0 hit points, you make a death saving throw instead of suffering a death saving throw failure. Nice to have. Not really sure. epic. Again, you're at 20th level. There's probably... Uh... Yeah, one of the lower chance of you going down in the first place. Mm-hmm. Two, probably there's plenty of uh, uh, features that already, you know, let you pop back up. Let you pop back up. Or yeah. three, there's uh, going to be a cleric there. Right there, like up. Oh. Yeah, at level at level twenty, your cleric should be getting you up like immediately, uh, or really any healer. <laughs> True. Should be getting you up immediately. Uh, Epic Boon of Speed, available to Expert or Warrior group classes. Increase your dexterity to be a one up to 30. As a bonus action, you can take the Disengage action, which also ends the grapple to restraint conditions on you, and your speed increases by 30 feet. Nice to haves. Mm-hmm. If you're a rogue, you can already disengage. But being able to just immediately remove grapple and restraint, especially at higher levels against big monsters. A little freedom of movement effect right there. Yeah. Not not terrible. Also not super epic. Uh, the last epic boon is available to experts in mage group classes. It's the boon of night spirit. You can increase your dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma by one up to 30. Uh, while entirely within dim light or darkness, you can give yourself the invisible condition as a magic action. The condition ends uh, on you immediately after you take an action, a bonus action, or a reaction. And then while entirely in dim light or darkness, you have resistance to all damage except force, psychic, and radiant. 
That's I feel like that's a really fun thematic one for like a rogue. Sure. You know, maybe like a gloomstalker ranger, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, being able to instant invisible if you're in just even a little bit of dim light is very useful. Having resistance to a bunch of damage types when you're in dim light and darkness, if you can manifest them, which in a lot of cases is very easy. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's one of the better ones sure. that I've seen available, I think. Uh, The last feat that they have is the Weapon Master feat. This is available at 4th level and up, so you cannot take it at level 1 with a background. You increase your strength or dexterity score by 1 up to a maximum of 20, and you also get the mastery property. Your training with weapons allows you to use the mastery property of one kind of simpler martial weapon of your choice, provided you are proficient with it. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can change the kind of weapon you chose to another eligible kind. Giving Weapon Mastery available to all of the classes. Yes. Perfectly fine. Uh, The epic boons still think they can be a bit more epic. Agreed. But they're certainly better. And again, it's one of those things like how much time do you spend? uh, Do you spend actually creating around that space when a very small percentage of the games that are played Mm -hmm. are going to use utilize them? Yeah. I agree. All right, let's move on to the classes now. We have the barbarian class. It's in the warrior group. Barbarians, the main updates from the design notes here. A lot of these were inspired by the Player's Handbook survey in 2021. Rage can now be extended with a bonus action each round. Taking damage does not extend it, but forcing someone to make a saving throw does. The focus is now on what you do, not what's done to you. Also, the playtest rage can last for 10 minutes rather than one, and finally rage is now stopped by the incapacitated condition. There's, I, the, the, the fact that it was not always like this is kind of dumbfounding to me. It was always very frustrating that it's like, I have to hit myself, or I have to attack a tree, or I have to like do something to keep my rage going. It's like, if I'm fucking pissed off, I'm going to be pissed off for a little bit. Yeah, you know? I, I do like this change in focus of, of uh, yeah, the, the Barbarian had a lot of agency taken away from it in the 2014 version, mm. and now these somewhat, honestly, simple changes are bringing it back to giving it to the player Mm -hmm. uh i also like the note that finally rage is now stopped by the incapacitated condition yeah which previously you get knocked out and you're just like i'm down but angry about it i'm angry unconscious (laughs) i mean i've been bad i've been mad while dreaming before don't get mad don't get me wrong but true uh the weapon mastery is a new first level feature giving you access to two weapons that you can use the mastery property on. Uh, that also increases to three at level four, and then four at level 10, you cap out at four weapon masteries that you can have at a single time with the Barbarian, which, to be fair, what Barbarian is wielding four different weapons? Maybe this one now. Well, maybe now. Uh, the second level feature, a new one, Primal Knowledge. It unlocks non-combat functionality for the Rage. Let's take a look. Primal Knowledge, you gain proficiency in another skill of your choice from the list of skills available to Barbarians at level 1. In addition, while your Rage is active, you can channel Primal Power when you attempt certain tasks. Whenever you make an ability check using one of the following skills, you can make it as a Strength check, even if normally, even if it normally uses a different ability. The abilities available to use this are Acrobatics, Intimidation, Perception, Stealth, or survival. When you use this ability, your strength represents primal power coursing through and around you. Acrobatics makes sense. Intimidation makes sense. Survival eh, makes sense. Perception and stealth. I am so fucking swole that I can see a mile. I'm and so I, fucking mad. I can see you. No, you can't. Okay. No. Oh, okay. No, you don't fucking see me. <laughs> I don't see anybody. Perception, I can kind of get, like, the heightened adrenaline. It's like I'm I'm fucking zoned in. Yeah. And kind of the same for stealth. It's a little bit of a stretch, but those are just useful abilities. Sure. And again, rage doesn't necessarily have to mean anger. Rage is just your mechanic. It's just the name of the mechanic. And a lot of people use different things for it. There's the... I like like the idea of just an adrenaline rush. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Next... We have the danger sense has been merged with feral instinct and the limitations on its use have been removed. We'll scroll down to that feature. Mm-hmm. Feral instinct is a level seven feature. Your instincts are so honed that you have advantage on initiative rolls and dexterity saving throws with no downside. Yes. So just a flat benefit constantly. Market improvement. Uh, next, we have Indomitable Might, which has moved from 18th level to 9th level. Indomitable Might, of course, with your total for a strength check is less than your strength score. You can use your score in place of the strength check total. 
it was a good it was a good level 18 ability much better at level 9 absolutely much more useful since a lot of focus on the barbarian is to dump stuff into strength can you get both bonus to strength to damage and stuff like that um having it actually the fact that you're not going to be failing a lot of stuff as the strong man mm-hmm uh, at this point. Yeah. Uh, Brutal Critical has been delayed from 9th level to 11th level, but its damage has been increased. Uh, it is now also available when you hit with a weapon or an unarmed strike using strength. Uh, the target takes extra damage equal to your Barbarian level, and it's the same type dealt previously. A little bit of a delay, but a buff to damage. Mm-hmm. I think that's fine. Uh, Persistent Rage uh, remains the same, but it is moved up from 15th level to 13th level. Relentless Rage has been delayed from 11th level to 15th level, and rather than restoring you to one hit point, it restores a number of hit points equal to twice your Barbarian level. That change will help prevent the Barbarian from immediately dropping back down to zero hit points. So a buff, a four levels is a big delay 11th to 15th is a big delay but the feature is much better and then it also kind of makes that epic boon a little bit more powerful yeah it really does but if you have this feature why would you take that epic but it's a whole it's a whole thing uh rage resurgence is a new 17th level feature that restores a use of rage whenever you roll initiative because of this feature the barbarian does not gain unlimited uses of rage at level 20 Primal Champion has moved from level 20 to level 18, so it's moved up a bit to make room for the Epic Boon feat at level 20. And its increase was changed from 4 to 2. If you are an 18th level Barbarian, why can't you just have a 24 strength and a 24 constitution? Yeah. It seems, it seems like a bit of an unnecessary debuff, but whatever. It moved up from two levels. And then, of course, Epic Boon is the 20th level feature. So base barbarian largely unchanged uh you some of the some of the class features have been moved around i think most of the changes have been net positives yeah for the barbarian especially with the addition of weapon mastery uh and you get a lot of feats still so that's fun yeah i think that uh the that's oftentimes a problem that a barbarian had uh in in the 2014 edition is as i've played a bar I played a barbarian just kind of got boring you know like there wasn't much to do because they didn't have a lot of outside of uh, of combat use and even in combat you kind of had you were single minded so uh, changing things around here makes it a little more a little faster you know mm-hmm. um, but I think that the uh, more interesting part is the next part we're going to talk about yes the berserker barbarian this is the subclass that they have shown with it Main updates, there's four. Frenzy no longer causes you to gain a level of exhaustion. In addition, it causes you to deal extra damage each round that you use your reckless attack feature instead of giving you a bonus action attack, which conflicts with the rage's use of a bonus action to maintain itself if you're not making an attack. Yeah. So Frenzy previously was one of the most damning features because there's not a lot in 5th edition that... That is, you do some, in order to get a positive benefit, you take a major negative, uh, um, a major drawback. Yeah. Exhaustion is a massive, massive drawback that lasts for the entire rest of your day. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of like, why would I use this feature unless it's like, unless we're going Nova, right? Mm-hmm. So now the fact that they're letting you use your cool thing, that's the benefit. Yes. And the damage has, has been increased. When you recklessly attack while your rage is active, you deal extra damage to the first target you hit on your turn with a strength-based attack. To determine the extra damage, you roll a number of D6s equal to your rage damage bonus. As a friendly reminder, your rage damage bonus is 2 up until level 9 where it becomes 3 and then it becomes 4 at level 16 so it so this feature is going to scale with you when you get it you're going to be on your first attack dealing an extra 2d6 when you get to level 9 3d6 in addition to the regular bump you get from your rage bonus and you're getting advantage on the attack because you're recklessly attacking and then up at level 16 you're going to be getting 4d6 Mm -hmm. plus 4 with the rage plus the advantage with the reckless attack I think this is a flat out major improvement no downside (laughs) much much better Uh, at level 6 you get mindless rage it ends the charmed and frightened conditions on you rather than merely suspending them another thing that just seemed like a weird design choice in 2014 right 
Uh, next, Retaliation has moved from 14th level to 10th level, but otherwise has remained unchanged. This is just to put all of the classes in subclasses in line yep. with their level progression. And then Intimidating Presence has moved from 10th level to 14th level, so it's swapped. But it has also been improved. It can infect a group of creatures rather than only one, and your, ra your rage extends its range, and you don't have to spend your action to extend its duration. The specifics of Intimidating Presence as an action, you can strike terror into others while you're menacing presence as you swell with primal power. When you do so, each creature of your choice within 30 feet of you or 60 feet if you are in rage must make a wisdom saving throw, DC equal to 8 plus your proficiency plus your strength modifier, provided the creature isn't behind total cover. On a failed save, a creature has the frightened condition for one minute. At the end of each of the frightened creature's turns, the creature repeats the saving throw, ending it on a success. Once you've used this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. If you've run out of uses of your rage, you can ex expend a use of if you've run out of uses of this feature, sorry, you can expend a use of your rage, choosing not to activate the rage and activate Intimidating Presence instead. Bit of a delay, bit of a buff. I think the Berserker is hands down, flat out, just better than it was before. Agreed. Easier to play, n no major downsides that make you not want to use your features. Much, much better. Anything else you want to say about the Barbarian? No. No? no I, I, like I said, the, the, the Frenzy, that change to Frenzy was really one of the biggest ones um, mm -hmm. that I was excited about from this. All the other things have been positives, and I honestly think that the Barbarian players, mm -hmm. I don't know, at least the ones I've run across... You know, when it came to the when it came to the bard uh, uh, yeah. changes, the bard players are all up in arms, one way or the other. I think <laughs> the barbarian players are just happy to be here. The barbarian players are like this is they're just happy with all of the changes here. Absolutely, this is this is this is one of the few classes that I think is just a universal. This is better than it was before, which we stand here. Next, let's move on to the fighter. Probably the most exciting changes mm -hmm. for me personally. Design notes. Persuasion has been added to the class's list of skills with an eye on the fantasy archetype of the persuasive warrior who leads others. Totally fine. Cool. Second wind can now be used more than once between long rests without requiring a short rest to recharge. It starts out with two uses. At fourth level, you get three uses. At tenth level, you get four uses all the way through the rest of your career as a fighter. Straight up buff, in my mind. Uh, weapon Mastery is a new first level feature giving you new ways to use your weapons. Uh, you start out with three, you get four at level four, you get five at level ten, and then you have five Weapon Masteries throughout the rest of your time. Most of the features that are associated with the fighter also now fuck with the Weapon Masteries, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> sure, they say that. Uh, Action Surge has had a little bit of a debuff. It is now limited to certain fighter-themed actions, so you can no longer dip two levels into a fighter to get Action Surge as a spellcaster to double-cast spells. Yeah. That's the main reason they did that. I think that's fine. Yeah, they, they, they've limited to attack, dash, disengage, or dodge. These are kind. These are more or less the uh, hasted actions as yeah. well. It, it's effectively just removing the magic action yes. as one of the options, which, to be fair... A Bladesinger wizard that dipped two levels into Fighter is going to probably be a more powerful wizard than most wizards just because they can double cast spells from time to time. And at the same time, this is one of those things where um, it it is a change and is a slight debuff, but doesn't mean. But it also opens up new options for things like multi-classing yeah. and how you build uh, your. It's, it's keeping your builds fresh and funky. The thing is, is for the fighter, it really isn't a debuff. For the for native fighters, no. No. For spellcasters that want to dip into fighter, it is now a debuff, which I think is totally fine. Uh, at level 7, you get a new feature, the Weapon Expert. Let's scroll down to the Weapon Expert. You have honed your use of weapons into an art. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can choose one of the kinds of mastery weapons you're using and replace its mastery property with another mastery property. The chosen kind of weapon must qualify for the new property. For example, you could replace the longsword's flex property with the push property. All of the wep all the weapon masteries have prerequisites for them. Some of them have none. Some of them have certain uh, weapon types. Mm -hmm. So you can't you can't topple with a dagger, for example. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Uh, and the property change applies only for you, not for others. The change ends when you finish on your next long rest. So every single adventuring day, you can choose what type of weapon property your weapons have. Yeah. Okay. This is 
perfect for the fighter. It is it is mechanically good. It is thematically good. Mm-hmm. It really and it, like I was saying earlier, the the fact that before in in five e in regular five e the a wizard with a, a wizard who somehow got proficiency in sword was probably going to be just as okay at a single attack as yeah. a fighter a, you know a high level fighter with a sword yeah. now okay now they get to flex with their good at exactly exactly especially if they're using a weapon with the flex property <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the indomitable feature now gives you a bonus to your reroll equal to your fighter level a straight up buff to indomitable as well awesome yeah it's great love it uh weapon adept is a new 13th level feature if we scroll down to weapon adept you are a master of weapons when you use your weapon expert feature on a kind of weapon you can give that kind of weapon two properties rather than one when you use them you can only use one at a time whenever you make an attack roll against a target with that kind of weapon you decide which of the two properties applies to the attack you make this decision before the attack hits or misses for example you could apply the push and topple properties to long swords and whenever you hit a target with a long sword you decide which of those properties to use against the target this is where it really gets fucking oh, yeah. cool this is where you can really start to customize your fighter where coupling the the battle master has not been shown in one in one dnd play test but coupling this with battle master maneuvers and you suddenly have just a seemingly infinite number of options mm-hmm. for controlling the battlefield in such an efficient way one of my favorite features of the entire fighter class. Improved Action Surge has moved from 17th level to 15th level. Unconquerable is a new 17th level feature which incorporates extra use functionality formerly part of Indomitable. So if we scroll up, Unconquerable. When you're in great peril, you can tap into a deep well of resilience within you. If you fail a saving throw and your Indomitable feature is expended, you can use it again without expending a use of your second wind, which also heals you. Oh, no. You can use it again by expending a use of your second wind and then heal in addition to yourself, in addition to the effects of Indomitable. Yeah, I love these these, these combining, these higher level features combining lower level features in a yeah. meaningful way. We saw that kind of a lot in the uh, Way of Mercy Monk from... Yes, um, yes. Was that Tasha's? Yes, that was Tasha's. Uh, and so I'm glad to see that they're actually also incorporating that design... Mm-hmm into uh base classes yes that is my second favorite monk subclass uh my first favorite monk subclass of course being the dungeon bros blood magic and hemocraft supplement (laughs) subclass for the monk check that out on drive through rpg uh third uh three extra attacks has moved from 20th level to 18th level so you get three extra attacks sooner making four attacks each turn there you go which is ridiculous uh and then the epic boon is the new 20th level feature base fighter thoughts i believe that the base fighter could get a lot of thoughts they they could get a lot they of thoughts. Could have, uh, i'm 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 a fan of these changes uh because the fighter is it's the joke bland class yes and that was because you know there wasn't a lot you could do besides you know outside of 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 uh your subclasses yes there wasn't a lot to do besides run up and hit or whatnot. Uh, even if you got to hit a lot, it was just run up and hit. And now you can, like you're saying, even without taking the um, Battlemaster class, the subclass, control a lot of the battlefield, whether it's just run over here, knock this guy down, go over here, take this guy's uh, focus away from yeah. uh, a squishy person. That's awesome. I the, the, the weapon masteries being unlocked for the fighter... Being able to customize their weapon masteries, being able to have multiple weapon masteries is just, it's so flavorful for the fighter. It makes the fighter the master of fighting. Mm -hmm. They mastered their weapons more than anyone else. And they're going to master their weapon masteries in a way that no other class is going to be able to. And I think that's awesome. Great flavor win, great mechanic win. Uh, The subclass that is included with the fighter is the champion fighter. Design notes, uh, adaptable vigor is a new third level feature giving the champion some non-combat utility. At level three, adaptive, adaptable victor, Jeez, you've studied your friends and foes alike and learned that victory relies on adaptability. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can gain proficiency in one skill from those available to this class at first level. As you remind yourself of past lessons, the proficiency lasts until you finish your next long rest. 
So it is just an additional proficiency that you can swap out every time you sleep. Mm -hmm. There was a spell that they included in one of the recent books that was just that. Mm -hmm. And I like that this is once per day, you just do it. Yeah, that's nice. That is very nice. A remarkable athlete, one of the lower rated fighter features has been replaced by both Adaptable Victor, which we have gotten at third level, as well as Heroic Warrior, which you get at sixth level. The thrill of battle drives you towards victory. Once per combat, you can give yourself heroic advantage if you start your turn without it. Heroic advantage, of course, is just uh, is just inspiration. Inspiration. That's all it is. I mean, hey, once uh, you get one free at free advantage, yes, um, without having to manipulate. Yes. So, remarkable athlete has been removed, and in place we got those two features. You also get the additional fighting style. It is moved from tenth level to sixth level, so you get it sooner at the same time that you get your heroic warrior, which I think is just. A net positive. And then Survivor has been enhanced. It also benefits your death saving throws now. Survivor is the 14th level feature where you get two abilities. Defy Death. You have advantage on death saving throws. Moreover, when you roll an 18, 19, or 20 on a death save, you get the benefit of rolling a 20. Heroic Rally. At the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to 5 plus your constitution modifier. If you have no more than half your hit points left, you do not gain this benefit if you have 0 hit points. Again, another hit to that epic boon of not dying. <laughs> it also makes uh, your fighter a little bit of a vampire. Because that, that heroic rally is literally just a vampire effect. Like, kind of. Uh, stat block ability. Of just, it, it's just regeneration. It's just regeneration. Yeah. I mean, great. It's cool. I'm into it. I like Get the, in the fight and keep in it. The champion fighter is still the most fightery fighter that ever fightered, but the fighter is now more unique. Yeah. So it's a more unique fighteriest fighter that's ever fightered. So now when you play a human fighter, people aren't going to make fun of you. No, they probably still. They'll probably still make probably fun still of you. Make fun but of that's you. just because that's your friends. Yeah. If your friends don't make fun of you, are they really your friends? I don't know. Interesting. Do we have any? Do we have it? We, we've we been going for like 45 minutes and I've been seeing you eyeing the TikTok live chat. We record this podcast live on TikTok in addition to ourselves to post on podcast services around the globe. And we've been talking a lot. We've gotten the weapon masteries down. We've gotten the feats down. We've gotten through the fighter and the barbarian. Do we have any thoughts in the TikTok live chat? There have been a, there have been quite a few, a few chats, chats lighting up today. We appreciate that guys for those of you liking and, and uh, chatting with us. There are some of these that we'll just throw to the end of the episode just because uh, that's how, that's what, that's what we, we do. do. Um, that's what we do. I have seen scrolling. Uh, shout out Marin Jane for getting the number one gifter badge. Hey, thank as you. As well as I saw Chill with Vibes Man was thrown in some earlier. Um, do, 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 do. If not, we can simply move on to the sorcerer as well. I thought I saw something. Uh, here we go. Alex uh, Fasello asks, why aren't pure melee, f- melee fighters viable when they should be? Well, we've discussed this. It, this has been a much discussed in the community. And spellcast, we've, we've talked about this before, of the linear martial versus the exponential spellcaster. Um, wizards, sorcerers, to a lesser extent, warlocks, uh, clerics, druids, the full spellcasting classes once they hit level five, they get access to third level spells. That's where they get things like fireball, fly, counter spell, very powerful abilities that then only grow in power exponentially every two levels when they get a new level of spell available to them. Uh, whereas fighter, barbarian, rogue to a little bit of a lesser extent because of sneak attack, but the ranger and the paladin certainly, uh, even though they get access to spell casting, it's delayed where... Your weapon damage does not increase except for the ability score that you are using to make the attack with, unless you take a feature or have a feature that gives you additional damage. The Battlemaster is the most popular fighter subclass for a reason. All of the Battlemaster maneuvers deal extra damage. There's a reason Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter are so popular. It's because they deal extra damage. Mm-hmm. Um, so their damage is only going to scale one way, whereas every other class is going to shoot All the spellcasters are going to shoot way up. And weapon masteries, they don't solve that problem. That is my one thing. The weapon masteries don't really solve that problem. It gives them more utility. It makes them more useful. gives them effects that martial classes wouldn't normally have access to. But it really comes down to damage. I like what Keenan says here. Keenan Perry says, viable is such a loaded term. It's not competition. If you want to be a fighter, be a fighter. Absolutely. This uh, D&D is one of those that... 
the right way to play D&D is the way that you like to play it. Yes. Um, as long as you and your group are all on the same page, build the build the character you want to you want to play, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Vi- any class can be viable. Any any multi-class can be viable. It just depends on if your party is willing to go along with it. Yeah. And just because you're not dealing the most damage or being the most effective doesn't mean you're not viable or not serving a purpose. Or not having fun. Exactly. Exactly. All right, let's move on. We've got the spellcasters now. We got the sorcerer. We're gonna be move. We're gonna be bebop scatting around this document now, which is a little bit annoying. But the sorcerer updates. Innate sorcery is a new first level feature, giving two sorcerer only spells that represent the roiling magic within. The other new sorcerer features in this playtest emphasize the sorcerer's ability to tap into their innate magic to create extraordinary effects. Innate sorcery. An event in your past left an indelible mark on you, infusing you with a simmering magic that sometimes challenge to control. You gain two spells, Chaos Bolt and Sorcerer's Burst. Chaos Bolt, of course, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, but let's scroll back up to the magic and we'll pull up Sorcerer's Burst. Sorcerer's Burst is a cantrip that is available, an evocation cantrip available only to sorcerers. It is a casting time of one action with a range of 120 feet, verbal, somatic, and is instantaneous. You cast Sorceress Energy at one creature or object within range. You make a ranged attack roll against the target. On a hit, the target takes 1d6 damage. If you roll a 6 on the d6 for the spell, you can roll another d6 and add it to the damage. Whenever you cast the spell, the maximum number of these d6s you can add to the spell's damage equals your spellcasting ability modifier. You choose the damage type each time you cast the spell, choosing Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, Poison, Psychic, or Thunder. For those of you that have played other tabletop RPGs, this this mechanic is referred often to as Dice Explosion or Exploding Dice, where if you roll the maximum value, you get to roll it again and then add it on top of. That is an awesome mechanic that i'm a big fan of and being able to do that as a sorcerer just whenever if you roll a six on your core cantrip and then also being able to choose from your damage type right it's a lot of versatility all right going back to the sorcerer man this is going to sit at one of at either the spells or the sorcerers you sit at the spells i'll sit at the spells you sit at the spells i'm gonna let you read the spells i think that's smarter that is smart hey sam that was a really good idea thank you i appreciate that this is the only validation you've ever given me I was about to say that's not true. (laughs) (laughs) Spellcasting gives you more spells to the sorcerer over the life of the character, now capping out at 22 known spells rather than 15. It's one of the most requested changes to the class. 22 in addition to spells that you are just going to know innately as a sorcerer. Font of Magic now has a sorcerer level prerequisite for creating each spell slot. So let's scroll down. We've got Font of Magic. All right. Sorcery points. You have two sorcery points and you gain more as you reach higher levels as shown in the sorcery points column. Uh, Converting a spell slot to sorcery points, you can do it as a bonus action. And then the chart at the bottom, uh, first level spell slot requires two sorcery points. You need to be at least second level to do that. Second level spell slots can be made with three. You need to be third level. Third level spell slots can be made with five. You need to be fifth level. Uh, fourth level spell slots require six points and you need to be seventh level and then fifth level spell slots require seven sorcery points at ninth level minimum next meta magic has been moved from third level to second level the feature also now gives you three meta magic options instead of two and you get three more at 13th level this allows you to change one of your meta magic and it also allows you to change one of your meta magic options after each long rest that amount of versatility for meta magic is phenomenal Mm -hmm. previously you might have had to really focus on like do i either want to have what spells do i want to use based that i can use almost of my meta magic options on or am i just going to you know kind of pick and choose and and be sad later yes uh i think ultimately you're going to end up getting more meta magic options when you cap out which would be at 13th you get six options but you'll be able to change them out whenever you want so it doesn't really matter which is awesome Uh, sorceress vitality is a new fifth level feature at fifth level You use your innate magic to heal yourself. You always have the Sorceress Vitality spell prepared. Sam, what is the Sorceress Vitality spell? Scrolling down to the Sorceress Vitality spell. Sorceress Vitality. Third level abjuration spell. Casting time and action. Range of self. Verbal somatic opponents. Duration instant. You draw on your innate magic to fill yourself with vitality. You regain a number of hit points equal to 2d6 plus your spell casting ability modifier. And if you have any of the following conditions, they end on you blinded, deafened, or and poisoned. 
At higher levels, when you cast this spell at 4th level or higher, the healing is increased by 1d4 for each spell slot above 3rd level. So they're they're letting the sorcerers dip their toe into some healing. It's only for themselves, mm-hmm. so they can't heal the party, which I think is a kind of a hard rule that they're going to stick to with the sorcerer, the warlock, and the wizard, outside of the specific subclasses that let them do that. Right. Um, great. I think I think for a third level spell slot, it's pro- you've got better options. But I mean, if you need to heal yourself or you need to end one of those conditions, you got to do what you got to do. You got yeah. Sorceress incarnate or sorry i skipped one arcane eruption is a new seventh level feature at level seven you can now unleash magical energy that rolls inside you you always have the arcane eruption spell prepared samuel what is the arcane eruption spell the arcane eruption spell is a fourth level evocation spell that's an action in a range of 120 feet churning magical energy explodes in a 20 foot radius sphere centered at a point you choose within range. When you cast a spell, select a damage type dealt by the explosion. Acid, cold, fire, lightning, poison, psychic, or thunder. Each creature in the sphere must make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, a creature takes 6d6 damage of the chosen type. On a successful save, the creature takes half. So less damage than a fireball, but you get different damage types. But there's more. Oh. Choose one of the D6s. The number rolled on that die determines the condition that is applied to each mm-hmm. creature that failed its save, mm-hmm. as shown below. Mm-hmm. A creature has the condition until the end of your next turn. The conditions are 1 through 6, being incapacitated, blinded, frightened, poisoned, charmed, and deafened. In that order. In that order. So a slightly lesser powerful fireball that you get to choose the damage type of, that also inflicts somewhat debilitating conditions, kind of randomly, but you do get to choose from among the damage dice that you've rolled. Yeah, and I mean, you get, uh, you have six damage die at third level, or at fourth level, and then more as you uh, cast it up. So the likelihood that, obviously, probably that number one that you're always wanting is the one on the damage die, the lowest damage, but it's incapacitated condition. That is... It's one of the it, mechanically and just uh, flavor wise, it's like you're dealing less damage outright, but instead that damage is being channeled into simply removing their ability to do anything. Mm-hmm. I kind of like the flavor of that. And being able to inflict the incapacitated condition at level four, especially in an area of effect, that is that is. that can possibly make the spell much more powerful than a fireball and just simply dealing damage. Uh, at ninth level, you get Sorcery Incarnate, a new feature. Fueled by arcane power within, you can transform yourself into magical energy. You always have the Sorcery Incarnate spell prepared. What is the Sorcery Incarnate spell? This is a fifth level transmutation spell. It has a casting time of bonus action, and it is can last up to a minute with concentration. Magic within you blooms, transforming you into a glimmering being of magical energy for the duration. You regain 1d4 sorcery points. Until the spell ends, you also gain the following benefits. You can use up to two of your metamagic options on each spell you cast, provided you pay the sorcery cost, sorcery point cost, and you have advantage on attack rolls of every spell you cast. That's awesome. I, 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 that's one thing that the sorcerer has always kind of missed because like the paladins always had that level 20 ability where they become like an avatar of their mm-hmm. of their god or something and sorcerers always kind of felt like the the flavor around them was having a having like all of this rampant magic just in you that at a moment's notice can like pop out and then being able to harness that in a meaningful way, there wasn't really a feature that allowed you to do this. This sounds awesome. Yeah, there's been some subclass stuff uh, for different um, sorcerer subclasses that kind of give a little bit of like, oh, you can enter a state or or whatever, but this is just the base class. That's what this is. Uh, And and you're right, really drawing out that idea of Mm -hmm. you have this innate magical ability. And the abilities are actually quite powerful Mm -hmm. and useful. Big fan. Next, Sorceress Restoration has moved from 20th level to 15th level and now also restores some sorcery points when you roll initiative. Sorceress Restoration, of course, you regain four expended sorcery points whenever you roll initiative or you finish a long rest. So you will, at 15th level, you will never not have some sorcery points if you're in combat. Uh, Next, Arcane Apotheosis is the new 18th level feature. Arcane Apotheosis, you now 
are so suffused with magic that you can alter reality itself. You always have the wish spell prepared, and if you undergo the spell's casting stress, you have no chance of losing the ability to cast the spell. In addition, you can cast Wish to replicate a spell of 1st through 8th level without expending a ninth level spell slot. You instead expend a slot of the replicated spell's level. Once you use Wish this way, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Oops, I wish I could really cast Teleport right now, but I don't know Teleport. I'll just use a 7th level spell slot to cast Wish as Teleport. That, th this is a great feature making removing the downside of the wish spell the most powerful spell in the game yep being able to use the safe option without having to use your ninth level spell slot to do so meaning you can cast wish twice a day <laughs> this is a great 18th level spell this is a great capstone feature for a sorcerer you hit i think you hit it right on the head the capstone feature which as we were saying earlier the the 2014 player's handbook those capstone features usually just fell mm -hmm. short uh here and and honestly, you know, prior to this, you know, I would always think of the bard as casting wish or the wizard as casting wish. Now it's clear, because of your innate, innate magical ability, you are the wish caster. You are the wish caster for sure. And that doesn't mean that the bard or wizard are not going to want wish. Absolutely right. Yeah. But uh, that is that is awesome. And of course, the new twentieth level feature being the epic boon, um, sorcerer. Is one of the few classes them and them and the fighter. Really, honestly, all three of these classes so far have been very net positive changes mm -hmm. to the to the base classes in the twenty fourteen players handbook. It's uh, refreshing to see versus what they did to the uh, the poor druid and the poor paladin. Yeah, I mean they were very powerful classes that needed to be knocked down maybe a hair. I think they went way too far. They didn't just knock them down a hair. They uh, pushed them in the mud and then um, knee capped them. Knee capped them for sure. For sure. Uh, we do have a quick section on meta magic options with design notes. Careful spell now prevents an affected creature from taking half damage on a successful save. Very good. So now you can just fireball your party and they're totally fine. <laughs> uh, distance spell increases a spell's range by a number of feet based on your sorcerer level rather than doubling the spell's range. For most spells, this is going to result in a greater increase than before, but for some it will not. That is okay. Still a net positive. Extended spell now also makes it easier to maintain concentration on the affected spell. Extended spell gives you advantage on concentration checks now, which is very useful. Uh, heightened spell now costs two sorcery points rather than three, and it imposes disadvantage on all of the target's saves against the spell rather than just the first save. That was a big criticism of heightened spell was, one, it was too expensive, mm -hmm. and uh, for spells that allow creatures to make a saving throw to remove the effect, those, were not, those would not be a disadvantage, and now they are. So much better. Quickened spell now includes a clarification on how it interacts with the game's general rule on casting bonus action spells. They discovered that some players read quickened spell as an exception to that general rule, which was not the intent. What they mean, the bonus action spell, if you cast a spell that has a level as a bonus action, the only spell you can cast as an action must be a cantrip. Some people saw quickened spell as I'm casting a, a spell as an action and this and I'm simply changing it to a bonus action, so it's not casting a spell with a casting time as a bonus action. So it went, would we never really interpreted it that way, I no. don't think. I think that the that specific rule is confusing to start. Yes. Um, and then that I understand why a lot of people were misinterpreting it. Uh, there has been, of course, the errata. Um, mm -hmm. the Sage Compendium where they clarified things like that. Yes. Yes. Uh. That no no change to its power level. It's just a clarification on the rules here. Yes. Effectively exactly the same. Seeking Spell has been imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. If you're not familiar, Seeking Spell, if you make an attack roll for a spell and miss, you can use two sorcery points to re-roll the d20 and you must use the new roll. You can use Seeking Spell even if you've already used different metamagic options during the casting of the spell. I like that they've been taking some of the of everything features that have been in Xanathar's and Tasha's and mm -hmm. then moving them to the new player's handbook. Transmuted spell has also been imported from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, for a sorcery point, you can change the damage type of one of the spells you cast to either acid, cold, fire, lightning, poison, or thunder. So you can have your lightning ball instead of fireball or your cold ball. Lightning. 
It's a little bit frightening. Sorry. It's also just kind of giving the sorcerer more of that flavor of, like, augmenting magic Mm -hmm. a lot more easily. Twin Spell has been redesigned. The 2014 version was, quote, too powerful, since it basically allowed you to cast two spells on the same turn, as in Quickened Spell, and to cast the extra spell with a sorcery point discount. For example, a third level spell slot normally costs five sorcery points, but in Twin Spell, it would only cost three. The targeting limitation of Twin Spell failed to contain how overpowered the option was and caused confusion. The new version of Twin Spell keeps the sorcery point discount, with Quicken Spell carrying the extra spell on a turn weight. This redesign has allowed us to remove the targeting limitation that Twin Spell had before. Twin Spell as it is now. Cost is 1 to 5 sorcery points. When you cast a spell of 1st to 5th level that you also cast on your previous turn by expending a spell slot, you can fuel this turn's casting of the spell by spending a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level rather than expending a spell slot. So if you're casting the same spell every single turn, you get a discount on it if you Mm -hmm. use sorcery points to cast it instead of a spell slot. Massive, massive debuff. But I can also kind of see where they're coming from. I also don't think it was that that overpowered to begin with. Yeah, the the uses of twin spell while wow, powerful were kind of niche, like they said, because the due to the targeting rec- requirements. Yeah, you're not twinning a fireball. No, you have to. Uh, I think the f- most fun you know version of it I ever heard was twinning a uh, dragon fire, dragon's breath, dragon's breath. Yes, putting it on. All right. You have an animal and I have an animal. Now they both have fire breath. That was that was just a fun thing to fuck around with because if you had two uh, characters that had familiars, familiars can't attack in combat, but they can activate abilities in combat, including activating your dragon's breath. So you can give them both dragon's breath and create just two massive overlapping cones of damage. Yeah. <laughs> Which was fun. It was fun. And twin spell was fun. I can see where they're coming from. I'm sure the, they're also trying to prevent... Uh, the we designed this really cool single target spell that now becomes completely fucking busted with mm-hmm. twin spell and it still serves a purpose um i think they could probably could have just replaced it with a different keeping the twin spell name and now you're not casting targeting two things with the same spell kind of feels you're doing it over two two turns being able to double it up i think they could have just removed it and created a new one they could have but you know they wanted to keep the the lore, I guess. I don't, I don't sure. Know. The, the history. The legacy. Whatever. <laughs> the legacy of Twin Spell. Yeah. Uh, the subclass that we get with the sorcerer is Draconic Sorcery. Design notes. Draconic Sorcery, formerly Draconic Bloodline, has the new naming convention for the sorcerer subclass, X Sorcery, where X is a word like Draconic, Aberrant, Clockwork, etc. Draconic Resilience now gives a base AC that is 10 plus your dexterity and charisma modifiers rather than 13 plus dexterity. This change will result in higher AC at later levels. Also, chances are you probably have a plus 3 charisma when you are at level 1. Yeah. It's very easy to get there. And so not a, not a debuff at all. Dragon Speech, formerly Draconic Ancestor, now lets you communicate with any creature that has the dragon type. The damage type choice has moved to Elemental Affinity. Elemental Affinity no longer charges a sorcery point for the resistance that it would give. In surveys, people have requested more uses for the damage type associated with this feature. The playtest versions of the following features, Draconic Exhalation and Dragon Wings, both respond to that request. Dragon's Draconic Exhalation has replaced Draconic Presence, a very low-rated feature for the subclass. And now Dragon Wings modifies the Sorcery Incarnate spell and includes a damage option. So that's that's a whole lot right now. Draconic Resilience at level 3. Your hit point maximum increases by 3 and increases by 1 again whenever you gain another sorcery level. Parts of you are also covered by Draconic Scales, giving you 10 plus your Dexterity plus your Charisma. Draconic Speech, you no longer know Draconic, mm-hmm. which I think Draconic Speech, they could have just given you Draconic and then also this ability. It seems a little unnecessary. Uh... The ability, of course, being able to communicate and be understood by uh, any creature that has the dragon type as well as you understand it. Elemental Affinity. You choose one of the damage types associated with dragons, acid, cold, fire, poison, or lightning. You have resistance to that damage type, and when you cast a spell that deals damage of that type, you can add your charisma modifier to one damage roll of that spell. Draconic Exhalation at level 10. Once per turn, you when you cast the Sorceress Burst, 
you can instead exhale a 15-foot cone rather than selecting a target within range. To cast the spell this way, you must choose the damage type associated with your elemental affinity feature. When you do so, you make a separate attack and damage roll for each creature in the spell's cone. That is very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that they still keep the da the attack and damage roll aspect of it than making rather than making it a saving throw. I think that's just to streamline and make it simpler. Yeah. And then lastly, at 14th level, you get Dragon Wings. Your innate magic can now also manifest as spectral draconic wings on your back. While your sorcery incarnate spell is active, you sprout these wings, gain a fly speed equal to your regular speed, and can hover. In addition, at the end of each of your turns, you can flap the wings to unleash magical energy, dealing damage to each creature of your choice within 15 feet of your spell. Yourself. <laughs> your spell. Your spell. <laughs> the, your spell <laughs> the damage equals your charisma modifier and is the damage type of your elemental affinity feature. Damage is not very high on that. No. It's a, getting fly speed with your uh, sorcery incarnate feature or spell. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. Can use multiple, and and again because during, due to that spell in general, you have uh, more uses of your sorcery points and uh, advantage on everything. So it's all compounding into a very neat. You're you're becoming a dragon. Yeah, I think this is strictly better than Draconic Bloodline mm. in pretty much every way, except you don't know Draconic anymore, which yeah. is weird. But uh, the the whole the whole you know. Uh, different languages no giving i guess giving them innately in subclasses is a little, is a little goofy but yeah. it makes sense because you're most of these most of the backgrounds and these days have mm -hmm. you at least get to choose one additional yeah yeah uh being able to breathe dragon breath pretty great oh yeah kind of one of the core things that was missing from the dragon <laughs> sorcerer uh overall sorcerer thoughts i think the net positive I I was going back to having tried to build not having built a sorcerer in the past. It wasn't all that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and like sorcerers can be very powerful. They can be very nova. They can go nova. But if you want to be a long a long lasting sorcerer, maybe a little less vi uh, viability there. Yeah. So this gives it a little more fun and a little more few few more things to play with. Um, but though though going forward we're going to have a few more of these i do find it interesting the taking all the these features from spell casting classes and making them spells themselves yeah i it it seems like a little bit of an unnecessary thing but i think they're just trying to force the classes to interact more with the spell casting feature mm -hmm. more than their own features which yes. You know, six one, half dozen the other. You have to use spell slots now. You don't have to track a bunch of different resources. That's also true. I think that's the main reason for that. But now we get to a big contentious one. Yes. The Warlock. The Warlock. First thing you might notice, class group, mage, expected. Yes. Primary ability, intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. Yes, previously. Previously, it was just charisma yeah. in the 2014 edition. Next thing, you get some lore. Always love a little bit of lore, but uh, you look at the class table, and what's this? A spellcasting progression table that goes up to fifth level, like a half caster? What is going on here? Side note. A lot of changes. Side note. You say that might be the first thing you notice. You didn't notice it. <laughs> when we were looking at this uh, a week or two weeks ago, it took you until reading a different uh, feature of it. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about that. Um, design note, Warlock updates. Medium armor is now included in the class's armor training to better support Warlocks that walk the melee-oriented path. So you no longer have to be a Hexblade to wear medium armor. Cool. Net positive. And spellcasters are going to like to have medium armor. Pact Boon has been moved from third level to first. It now gives you Eldritch Blast and Hex and a spell of your choice from a group of three, all of which are now exclusive to Warlocks. The spell you choose is connected to the spell casting ability choice you then make. The spell incorporates the previous functionality of the three Pact options. So, if you go over to the spells, I'll go over the Pact Boons. Level one, you get to choose Pact of the Blade, Pact of the Chain, or Pact of the Tome. Pact of the Blade, you get to choose between Wisdom or Charisma as your spellcasting ability, 
and you gain the Pact spell, Pact Weapon. Pact of the Chain, you get to choose Intelligence or Charisma, and you get the Pact Familiar spell. And then Pact of the Tome, you choose between Intelligence or Wisdom, and you get the Book of Shadows Pact spell. So what is the Pact Weapon Pact spell? Pact Weapon. Action. Self. 24 hours. Track. Tracing arcane sigils in the air, you conjure a simple or martial weapon, melee weapon of your choice in your outstretched hand, or you create a or bond with a magical weapon you touch. The weapon you conjure or touch must lack the heavy property, and the spell fails if you touch a magical a magic item that is attuned to someone else. This is a cantrip. This is a cantrip. So it's just saying you can't steal someone else's yeah. bound magic weapon. Again, you gain the following benefits. Eldritch Warrior. When you attack with the weapon, you can use your spellcasting ability modifier for the attack and damage rolls instead of strength or dexterity. Proficiency. You have proficiency in the weapon. Returning weapon. If the weapon has the thrown property, the weapon returns to your hand immediately after hitting or missing a target. The spell ends early if you cast the spell again or die. When it ends, a conjured weapon disappears and your bound bond with a magical weapon stops. There's an upgrade to it. At 5th level... As, uh, as a 5th level Warlock, you gain the extra attack feature for the Conjured or Magical Weapon only. With this feature, you can attack twice with the weapon instead of once, and when you take the attack action on your turn. So it, it removed the invocation that you would need to take to attack twice. Mm-hmm. And it is now simply just something you get as a 5th level Warlock only. Being able to choose Wisdom or Intelligence as spellcasting ability mo- as your spellcasting abilities... Very contentious, I think. I, I I was not a fan of it when we first read through this. I'm more of a fan of it now just because it's like, ooh, wisdom. Ooh, you could multi-class this with, with a monk. You could, mul- you could multi-class this with a cleric. You could, mul- ooh, ooh, intrigue, options. Yeah, so the, the warlock has always been lauded as the very customizable, uh, versatile spellcaster and class in general. Um, and as we've seen, like, a lot of paladins dip, dip into hexblade and things mm-hmm. like that uh and and this particular the fact that it cho- whatever, which pact you choose gives you also some some versatility in which one so you could multi-class if you like yes all right pact of the chain the pact spell is pact familiar indeed it what is. does the pact familiar cantrip do uh casting time for this one is an hour it has a range of 10 feet and a duration of instantaneous interesting you summon an unearthly entity to serve you it manifests in an unoccupied space of your choice within range the creature uses the packed familiar stab block if you already have a familiar that familiar transforms into a new one but retains its memories if you don't you do not get a second pack familiar whenever you cast this spell choose the familiar's creature type apparition celestial dragon fey fiend or undead the choice affects the familiar's default appearance as noted in the parentheses it gives some examples. Uh, for example, a fake could be a pixie or a spirit. It, de- it does not, uh, and it determines certain traits in the stat block. You can alter the details of the creature's appearance each time you summon it. Combat. The familiar is an ally to you and your companions, and it obeys you. In combat, it shares your initiative, but it takes its turn immediately after you. On its turn, the familiar can dodge, can take takes the dodge action, and uses its move to avoid danger, unless you use your reaction to command it. To attack instead. Disappearance of the familiar. The familiar disappears if it drops zero hit points, if you dismiss it as a bonus action, or if you die. When it disappears, it leaves behind anything it was carrying or wearing. If you cast a spell again, you decide whether to summon the familiar that disappeared or a different one. Remote viewing. As a magic action, you can see what your familiar sees and hear what it hears until the end of your next turn. Upgrade. Starting at 5th level as a warlock, you can communicate telepathically with your familiar as long as you two are on the same plane of existence. Additionally, while perceiving through your familiar senses, you can also speak through your familiar in your own voice. That's pretty cool. Uh, Again, combining an Eldritch Invocation with... Basically, all of the Eldritch Invocations that... Well, not all of them. Some of them that would just simply improve your Pact Boon are now just given to you at 5th level with these spells. And then lastly, the Book of Shadows scroll into the book of shadows casting time one hour stitching together the strands of shadows you conjure forth a book into your hands the book contains eldritch magic that only you can access granting you the following benefits cantrips and rituals when the book appears choose two cantrips 
and choose two first level spells that have the ritual tag. The spells can be from the Arcane Divine and Primal spell lists, and they must be spells you don't already have prepared. While the book is on your person, you have the chosen spells prepared. Spell Focus. You can use this book as your spellcasting focus. The book disappears again if you cast a spell or die. Upgrade. When you reach 5th level of Warlock, the spell also enhances other cantrips while the book is on your person. You can add your Warlock spellcasting ability modifier to the damage roll of any cantrips you cast that don't already have the modifier added to its damage roll. Mm-hmm. Oh boy. Um, that, that's a lot to take in. And the pack boons, I think, are all strictly better. You get them at first level. Strictly better. Being able to choose your spell casting ability. That is that is a customizing win. Uh, it also kind of hurts that they don't all have charisma as an option. I get having the Pact of the Tome having all three options, and then the other two only having two options would be a little weird. I think they all three should just have all three. Personally, mm. uh, that does kind of remove a little bit of like why would you take anything but charisma if they can all be whatever. I get that. Um, yeah, it's going to affect a lot of multi-classing more than anything else. It, it really seems does. like just a weird change to begin with. Um, I mean, they already have two full charisma casters with uh, with the sorcerer and the bard. They have two full wisdom casters with the druid and uh, the cleric, and then one full intelligence caster with the wizard. So it, it's, a, it's a strange change. At the same time, you also have the intelligence for uh, the... well. It's a half it's a, caster with the artificer. True, or uh, the the third casters of uh, Eldritch Knight and uh, Arcane Trickster. Unless they change them, we unless they change them, we haven't seen. We will get uh, all the other subclasses at some point in the future. But yeah. yeah, right now, I don't know. We'll have to see how it plays. This is a, the, I think that's one of the most interesting changes and mm-hmm. most difficult to judge in isolation, like Absolutely. we are doing right now. Absolutely. Uh, also, packed magic has been replaced by spellcasting. The most requested change to Warlocks has been for them to be able to use their spells more often. They therefore now cap out at 15 spell slots instead of 4. The spell slot progression is the same as every half caster. Yep. Um, so you cap out at 5th level spells, getting your first one at 17th level, your first 4th level spell at 13th level, your first 3rd level spell at 9th, your first 2nd level spell at 5th, and then 1st level spells right out of the gate. Um, yes, you're going to be getting more spell slots your spell your spell level selection has now been delayed severely warlocks would still get second level spells at third level like full spell casters and they would still get third level spells at fifth level like full spell casters and that progression went along the way of the full spell casters until you got to fifth level spell slots, in which case you Mystic Arcanum would replace the sixth, seventh, and eighth level, eighth and ninth level spell slot spells. By making them a half caster, I have to say, this isn't a spell casting class anymore. This is a hybrid class. Mm-hmm. And including them in the mage group limits them in what they can take at that would be given to the expert and the warrior groups. But as a mage, they're the only mage that won't be able to cast a spell above fifth level anymore. Well, their Mystic Arcanum's changed. They still have Mystic Arcanum. Yeah, but Mystic Arcanum now just gives them more lower level spells that they can cast. We'll get we'll get to that when we get to that. Uh, next we have Eldritch Invocations. They now cap out at nine invocations rather than eight, so you get a little bit more. Uh, Mystic Arcanum has become an Eldritch Invocation option, which is now available as soon as fifth level. Previously, the Warlock waited until 11th level to get it. Let's scroll down to Mystic Arcanum. We're we're jumping around a little bit just because there's a lot to deal with here. If we look at the Eldritch Invocations, we're going to look at Mystic Arcanum. Oh my gosh, there's so many fucking options. Uh, Mystic Arcanum. Okay, so you do get access to higher level spells. Fair enough. Uh, Your exploration of the arcane have unlocked magic within you. Choose one spell from the arcane list that has a level for which you you qualify, as shown in the Mystic Arcanum table. Look for your warlock level on the table to see your maximum level of spell you can have. 
You can cast the chosen spell once without expending a spell slot. You must finish a long rest again before you can do so. It is a repeatable invocation. Warlocks of 5th and 6th level can take up to 3rd level spells, 7th and 8th, up to 4th. So the regular spell casting progression of 9 to 10, 5th, 11 to 12, 6th, 13 to 14, 7th, 15 to 16, 8th, and then 17th, 9th level spells. Still... It's it's a weird... It's forcing you to take Eldritch Invocations to get access to the full capability that the Warlock spellcasting would be able to do. It removes it from the spellcasting ability in general, which is something that they seem like they're forcing the other mage group classes to do by tying in the sorcerer features to the spell slots, and then we'll later see uh, wizard features being tied into the spell slots as well. It's completely different for the Warlock now, and it... I, you, they don't increase the number of invocations that you get enough. It is now removing your ability to take interesting invocations and forcing you, like, do you want to be more spell? It does let it, still lets it be custom. I, I'm so conflicted. I'm also, so conflicted on they've this. They've also just baseline removed. You need to take, a, if you weren't taking the upgrade to your, to your pact yeah. as an invocation, then that then what were you doing you know what were you why were you not doing that yeah so at the same time they've changed they've innately given you an invocation but i see what you're saying it really it really feels you know what it kind of feels like it feels like almost when you're trying to build an artificer yeah artificer has the all uh, uh, the opposite effect the opposite customization problem mm-hmm. which this is uh you have a blank slate almost yeah here, choose which spell casting option you're taking. Okay, now choose which spells based on that spell casting option, as well as when you get to certain levels, you can also choose just a random spell to. Whereas the artificer or is, other features or yeah. Whereas the artificer is all right. You have you have to choose five of these things and five of these things and five of these things and five of these things. Also, you have to change three of these things to match this thing. Also, this thing down up here that you chose yeah. is the it's... same as this thing down here that you didn't choose. The I would be more okay with el- with the changes to the spellcasting if you just got more Eldritch Invocations. Or Mystic Arcanum was a feature that wasn't tied into Eldritch Invocations. If Mystic Arcanum was just at those threshold levels of... What would it be? Oh my gosh, let me scroll all the way back down. The threshold levels of 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, and 17, if you just got one of each that you could swap out, I think that would be fine. And then keep the Eldritch Invocations cap still at 8. I think that would be fine. But by making it an Eldritch Invocation, you're you're vastly limiting the uh, the number available of Eldritch Invocations. Because am I going to am I going to get my old spellcasting progression that I would get as a warlock in 2014 and get the spells at the same rate that other classes in my group are going to be getting? Or do I want to take the Eldritchifications that would normally increase my abilities that the old world... It's just... They're changing so much all at once. Mm. And if they're going to tie Mystic Arcanum to Eldritch Invocations, then they need to do more Eldritch Invocations. Like, give you more Eldritch Invocation slots to fit in. Because it is still the most customizable class by far. Oh, and we've We've already completely gone off the rails of of our organization for these classes. Um, is there, I, f- I feel like there, there's some chatter, there's some chatter over here. Um, what's the, what's the TikTok live chat saying? Some things, uh, uh, some things we've mentioned. Um, Keenan says, I like how modular it's getting. Yeah. The warlock was always modular and customizable. True. You can cast more, uh, utility spells at lower level. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. The number of spell slots is a great benefit. I just I think the progression of the level of them is the problem. I like just crafts. Uh, just crafts suggestion is warlock should not have any spell casting. Just give him thirty invocations. I mean, I think that'd be cool too. <laughs> make make eldritch. Give them the eldritch blast cantrip. Give them access to cantrips. Give them a fuck ton of eldritch invocations, and then mystic arcanum is their way they take spells. There you go. I I would I actually honestly I'm actually really into that idea. Right, that's pretty cool. You get. You, Wow, maybe each maybe each Eldritch invocation you get a a spell of that level and a spell slot of that level. 
That's a lot to keep track of. That's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> but it's also like I can only cast my spells once per day. So it's... I, that's in, that's interesting. I don't know if I'm into that. I don't know if I vibe with that, but it is an interesting option. That's that's weird. That is really weird. The, <laughs> the Warlock has gone from really cool and customizable to just strange and difficult to wrap your head around now, I think. This is, this is one of the prime examples that I see when it comes to why this should not be called... Uh, after the D&D Creator Summit... A lot of people, you know, a lot of those creators were like, they've said that this is not a new edition, which like, it needs to this be is one edition. of the prime examples of why this should at least be considered the 0. 0.5 yeah. or, or even if you want to push up to six, like sure, there's a lot of overlap and can you use the fifth edition rules? Absolutely. Will probably a lot of people who like the pack magic and the old invocation stuff asked along the lines of the druid and the paladin asked yeah. to use the 5e stuff possibly yeah will there will there come some people who really really love this warlock and you know find a million ways to break it absolutely mm. uh, another option is you can check out our video on youtube where we talk about um replacing pact magic with uh a feature an optional feature that's available to regular spellcasters and we modify it a little bit for pact magic uh in the dungeon master's guide called spell points uh, that's a fun way to play a warlock. I think that is a better way to play a warlock than this. Mm. But that's also me. Check out that video on YouTube. Link in the link tree in the bio. Um, let's 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 get back on track. <laughs> contact patron is an eleventh level feature allowing the warlock to contact their patron directly at wow. level eleven. They went really literal with the name of that one. I know, right? At level eleven. In the past. You've usually contacted your patron through intermediaries. Now you can communicate directly. You always have the contact other plane spell prepared. With this feature, you can cast the spell without expending a spell slot to contact your patron, and you automatically succeed on the spell saving throw. Once you cast the spell using this feature, you can no long you can not do so again until you finish a long rest. Lorewin, contact other planes, whatever. Yeah. But it's a Lorewin for sure. Uh, Hexmaster is a new 18th level feature. At 18th level, Hexmaster, you've mastered the dread application of hexes, allowing you to cast the hex spell without expending a spell slot. Should I think that should be a lower level feature, specifically because you can only deal the extra damage from the hex spell once per turn. Yeah. And, of course, uh, Hel Eldritch Master has been removed because it was based on the Pact Magic feature, which has been removed, and then Epic Boon at level 20. That is a lot that to go a through. <laughs> um, we're I'm just going to rapid fire through. There's so many changes to Eldritch Invocations. Uh, we're not going to get into. I'm not going to read any of them specifically, but I'm just going to run through the design note changes. Beguiling Influence has been replaced by Lessons of the First Ones, which you can which can be used to take the skilled feat or another eligible feat. Uh, Bewitching Whispers has been replaced by Mystic Arcanum. Book of Ancient Secrets has been absorbed into the Book of Shadows spell, as we talked about. Chains of Carceri, Dreadful Word have been replaced by Mystic Arcanum. Eyes of the Room Keeper now clarifies that it doesn't decode secret messages. Favor of the Chain Master has been... Uh, is the new is a new invocation that enhances Pact of the Chain. So let's actually take a look at that one since it's new. Ninth level Warlock or higher Pact of the Chain feature required. Uh, your bond with the familiar summoned by your Pact familiar spell grows more powerful whenever the familiar hits with its Eldritch Strike. The target experiences the following effect associated with the creature's creature type. Aberration, slowing slime. The target's speed is reduced by five feet until the end of your next turn, and it can't take the dash or disengage actions. Celestial, guiding light. The next attack roll against the target before the end of your next turn has advantage, and if the target has the invisible condition, that condition is suppressed for the duration. Dragon, draconic might. If the target is medium or smaller, it has the prone condition. Fey, beguiling sting. The target has the charmed condition until the end of your next turn and perceives both you and the familiar as the charmer. Fiend, unearthly toxin. The target has the poison condition until the end of your next turn. And finally, undead, whispers of the grave. The target has the frightened condition until the end of your next turn. You choose whether the target is frightened of you or the familiar fun i like that one yeah a little additional little buff uh to your to your little buddy yes uh, gaze of two minds is now usable as a bonus action rather than an action it no longer applies the blinded and deafened conditions to you and it allows you to cast spells from your space or from the other creature's space finally it now requires fifth level to take gift of protectors has been imported from toshan's cauldron of everything hexer is a new invocation that enhances Hex. Let's take a look at that. When you cast Hex, its range is 600 feet, and you have advantage on any constitution saving throw you make to maintain concentration on that spell specifically. 
Totally fine. I don't know if it's worth an invocation, but fine. That guy way over there. Do you see him? No, I do. Nope. Screw him. Give me, give me, hey, uh, Artificer, can I see your sniper rifle real quick? <laughs> then you just fucking hex him. Uh, Lessons of the first one is a new invocation that allows the warlock to dabble in different areas. Lessons of the old one. What do you do? You have received knowledge from an elder entity of the multiverse, allowing you to gain one feat of your choice, such as skilled, that is available to first level characters that lacks any prerequisites. So you get access to background features. I think that's fine. I'm into that. Life Drinker now requires level 9 rather than level 12, and it deals a d6 of extra damage, and it also heals you. Life Drinker, ninth level Warlock. It's the Pact of the Blade one. It used to just deal a little bit of extra damage. It is now a dice-based extra damage instead of just a flat extra charisma boost. And it heals you. That is a straight buff, and you get it sooner. Um, Minions of Chaos and Mire the Mind have been replaced by Mystic Arcanum. Mystic Arcanum is new. We talked about that already. Repelling Blast now works on creatures that are large or smaller, so you can affect more things. Sculptor of Flesh, Sign of Ill Omen, Thief of the Five Fates have all been replaced by Mystic Arcanum. Thirsting Blade has been absorbed into the Pact Weapon spell. Voice of the Chain Master has been absorbed into the Pact Familiar spell. And Witch Sight now simply just gives you True Sight. So now, now you, you can see more than just witches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can see more than witches. There's a witch over there. Yeah, we saw our guy. Yeah. Agonizing, they didn't mention this, but Agonizing Blast did have a change to it where it adds your spellcasting ability modifier than your charisma to um, Eldritch Blast's damage. Mm. Uh, they didn't mention that in the Eldritch Invocation updates. So How a lot. dare they? We I have know. to go beat up Wizards of the Coast now. A lot of invocations are being removed because they simply just gave you free castings of spells, which now Mystic Arcanum does. Uh, all of the other changes I feel like have been they've been absorbed into your packed boon that you just get at level 5 for free which is nice so in a way they are kind of giving you more Eldritch Invocations because a lot of Invocations are simply just Mystic Arcanum now or they've been absorbed into other things that you're already getting Mm -hmm. net positive on the Eldritch Invocations I just wish they gave us more of them that's fair Okay. Uh, the subclass option that they give you is the Fiend Patron. Design notes. Patron spells replaces the expanded spell list. Rather than merely expanding your spell list, Patron spells gives you certain spells that you always have prepared, and once per long rest, you can cast one of those spells without a spell slot. The list of spells has also been updated. The spells included are at 3rd level you get Burning Hands and Command, at 5th level you get Scorching Rain Suggestion, at 9th level you get Fear and Stinking Cloud, at 13th level you get Blight and Wall of Fire, and then at 17th level you get Flame Strike and Insect Plague. I think this is a great way for them to give you free castings of spells that are at a full spellcaster progression, whereas these are at your half caster progression. Hmm. Actually, Burning Hands is 2nd level. Is Burning Hands 1st level? I don't have that. No, that, that is not. A, yeah. That is not something in my knowledge. Scorching Ray is definitely not. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, this is half level. Pro- this is half spellcaster progression, not full spellcaster progression. Noted. I think that's a good play. A good way for them to give you spo- full spellcaster progression instead of half caster progression. Personally, Dark One's blessing is now also triggered by an enemy dropping to zero hit points within five feet of you. Dark One's blessing. When you reduce an enemy to zero hit points or an enemy drops to zero hit points within five feet of you, you gain temporary hit points equal to your spellcasting ability modifier plus your warlock level. Dark One's own luck can now be used a number of times equal to your spellcasting ability modifier rather than once per rest. Uh, you get When you make an ability check or saving throw, you can use the feature to add an additional d10 to the roll. Uh, you do so after the initial roll, but before any of the roll's effects occur, so before you know the outcome. Uh, you can use it a number of times equal to your spellcasting ability modifier. You regain all uses when you finish a long rest. Fiendish Resilience is no longer bypassed by magic or silvered weapons, which monsters almost never possess. That is, that, that is, fair. That is them being brutally honest with themselves. Oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And then Hurl Through Hell has now been used again if you can now be used again if you expend a spell slot of at least fourth level. The feature also now includes a saving throw for the target. So, Hurl Through Hell. When you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can use this feature to instantly transport the target through the lower hells. The creature disappears and hurdles through its nightmare landscape. At the end of your next turn, the target returns to the space it previously occupied or the nearest unoccupied space. If the target is not a fiend, it must make a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC upon its return. On a fail save, it takes 10d10 psychic damage. On a successful save, it takes half as much damage. Once you finish 
Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest unless you expend a spell slot of 4th level when you use it again. You can use this feature only once per turn. So it's a way for you to expend multiple spell slots in a turn to get up to 10d10 psychic damage. Mm -hmm. And you kind of remove them from the battlefield until your next turn. That's pretty cool. That's I think that's a market improvement. All right, that is the Warlock. There's a lot to take we, We've said a lot on the Warlock already, um, and and there's a lot of discussion to be had around it. Mm. Play test it. Play test it, absolutely. I would hate to... Uh, I would, uh, at this point, you know, a lot as a as a person who DMs a lot and yeah. plays, I and have, you know, I've, I've played with a lot of new players. This Warlock is one that I would be a little hesitant to... Uh, help a new player try and set up until yeah. I've done it a couple of times. Even even the previous warlock was a little bit of a was a little bit of a, a new player barrier. True. With the amount of customization. True. But we at last an hour and 43 minutes in come to the wizard. The last This is a long episode, guys. Bear with us. The wizard, mage group intelligence. It's all the same. Design notes. Spellcasting now allows you to use your spellbook as a spellcasting focus. Hey! About fucking time. <laughs> Wizard Spellbook is a new first level, f- level feature which consolidates spellbook rules into one place. In addition, this feature gives you the wizard only spell, Scribe Spell. All right. Wizard Spellbook, it's just all the rules for known spells, ritual casting, casting, creating a secondary spellbook, as well as the appearance, and the Scribe Spell spell. What does that spell do, Sam? First level, Transmutation Spell, Ritual, Wizard. Casting time, two hours per level of Scribed Spell. Uh, material components, a quill, a book, 50 gold of fine inks per level of the spell. The spell consumes the inks. Channeling magic through the quill and ink, you scribe an arcane spell into your spellbook or a blank book worth at least 50 gold. Then the scribe spell must be of a level for which you have a spell slot, and a book must lack the spell. As you magically scribe the spell, you must copy it from another spellbook or a spell scroll, or you must have it, pre- pre- you must have it prepared. If you copy it from a spell scroll, the s- scroll is destroyed. If you have a pre- spell... Pre- the. If you have the spell prepared, the casting time and components cost are halved. When the scroll, when the scribing is complete, the spell becomes one of your known spells in the book, appearing on its own page as if the book, unless the book is out of pages. Sorry, wait. Oh. Appearing on its own page if the book was out of pages. The spell appears in a cipher that is only understandable to you or someone casting the identify or scribe spell. If the book was blank before the scribing, the book is now your spell book. Wow, wizards loves to word, word there wordy up so, their shit. There were so many S followed by a constant <laughs> words in there. Uh, basically, this is uh, the the adding a spell to your spellbook rules into a turning it into a spell. That's really all this is. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Academic is a new second level feature. <laughs> Academic. Your time as a scholar has equipped you to recall a broad range of lore. When you take the study action, a dumb action, you have advantage on any intelligence check you make as part of that action. Great. Arcane recovery has moved from first level to second level. It has otherwise remained the same. Memorize spell is the new fifth level feature. Memorize spell. You have unlocked the secrets of the memorize spell. And add that spell to your spell book. Sam, what is Memorize Spell? Memorize Spell, third level divination ritual, wizard. Casting time, one minute. Components, your spell book, and some other stuff. You choose a spell from your spell book that you don't have prepared, and choose another spell you do have prepared. The unprepared spell replaces the prepared spell on your spell of prepared spells. On your list of prepared spells. Christ. (laughs) This replacement lasts until you cast Memorize Spell again, or you finish a long rest. At higher spells, such as 4th level or higher, you can replace an additional prepared spell with an unprepared spell for each slot above 3rd. This is, replace a prepared spell you have with an unprepared spell you have. Takes a minute. That, that's what this spell does. New feature, at 7th level, you get modify spell, which unlocks the modify spell spell. Spam, what does the modify spell spell do? <laughs> 
Christ. <laughs> Fourth level transmutation spell. Ritual. Wizard. One casting time, one minute. Components. Your spell book. Using arcane formulas in your spell book, you magically alter one arcane spell you have prepared. You can change the spell's color, sound, and smell, and make one of the following modifications. Components. Remove one of the spell's components, verbal, somatic, or material. You can't remove the material components of a spell that consume the component. Concentration. If the spell requires concentration, damage can't break your concentration on that spell. That is oh so powerful. That's re- yeah, that's a good one. Right? That is really fucking good. Damage types. If the spell has a damage type, replace it with one of the following. Acid, cold, fire, lightning, necrotic, poison, or thunder. If the spell has multiple damage types, you can only change one of them. Range. The spell, if the spell has a range of at least 5 feet and doesn't have a range of self, increase its range to a number of feet equal to 30 times your wizard level. Ritual. If it lacks a ritual tag and has a casting time of at least 10 minutes, give it the ritual tag. Targets. If the spell affects one or more creatures and doesn't have a range of self, it now affects only your allies or enemies you choose when you cast Modify Spell. The chosen alteration lasts until you cast Modify Spell again or you finish a long rest. This altered version of the spell can't be added to the spellbook or spell scrolls without first casting Create Spell. When you cast this spell using a slot of 5th level or higher, you can choose an additional spell modification for each slot above 4th level. You know, it's interesting you bring up Create Spell, because at ninth level you get the Create Spell feature, which has unlocked the secrets of the Create Spell spell. Sam, what does the Create Spell spell do? Create Spell, 5th level, Transmutation Spell, Wizard. Casting Time, Reaction, in response to yourself, casting Modify Spell. Components, an Arcane Focus, which the spell consumes, worth at least uh, 1,000 gold pieces per level of spell altered by Modify Spell. Synthesizing your Arcane Knowledge and Power to strive to create a new spell, To succeed, you must concentrate for one hour and meditate on the spell you just altered with Modify Spell. Otherwise, the spell fails. If you succeed, you must start casting Scribe Spell within the next ten minutes and add the altered spell to your spellbook. Once the spell is in your spellbook, it becomes one of your known spells. It gains the wizard source tag rather than the arcane tag, and it gains the name of your choice. All right. That's That's a lot for a trio of spells that all work very intimately together. All of this is doing, these, this trio of spells, when you get to level 9, you are now able to change several of the parameters of any spell that you have, and then permanently add those modifications as options in your spell book. You could, theor- could I can't, the wording of that, I can't, that's so fucking wordy. Could you, in theory, let's say, modify fireball to deal cold damage. Mm-hmm. You create the spell, you scribe it into your spell book. That spell, could you then modify the range? Create the spell, scribe the spell, and then modify and then go through and do multiple modifications through several series of creating new spells. I believe you could either do that, that or you could expend a higher level spell slot to do them all at once. To do them all at once. Which yes. would save you cuz you do have to spend 1000 gold every it, time it would, you want to create the spell. It would it would save you on gold. That is so fucking wizardly. And one of the great, like, Mordenkainen's whatever, Autoluke's whatever spells. Wizards can now, on their own, le- like, on their own terms, create their own levels. Uh, in the YouTube video where they talked for, like, 40 minutes about this playtest, which we have gone well over at this point. <laughs> I they can down so much. I know, right? And... They talked about how they were going to also be adding rules to the Dungeon Master's Guide for creating brand new spells, and it is probably going to be interacting with the Create Spell, Scribe Spell, Modify Spell uh, spells as well. Um, This is a fucking flavor win and a half for the wizard, and it is also mechanizing something that has just kind of had to be homebrewed for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm very much into this. Also, the TikTok Live right now is getting some uh, really good cat action underneath the table. So enjoy that. Oh, look at that plopper. Okay. The... So fucking wordy. This is classic wizard shit. Oh yeah, <laughs> you have to be a wizard and under to enable to understand what the wizard does. Yes. But that being said, I agree. Complete flavor win and uh, a really cool um, 
way to customize your care your 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 play style and your character and this is so fucking cool and i'm really into it honestly uh the last the last three things spell mastery has been moved from 18th level to 15th level signature spells have been moved from 20th level to 18th level and then you get an epic boon at level 20 um this is the 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 base wizard i think is so much cooler i don't know if it's necessarily better i think it is better Mm-hmm. Especially with the spell mastery moved up and all, all the spell mastery and the signature spells moved up, giving you free castings of first and second level spells much sooner, as well as two third level spells. Um, much cooler, much cooler, much more, much more dorky. I was going <laughs> to say nerdy. It, it's dorky now. And I'm into that. One of my favorite things that they've done all over a lot of these classes that they that we've seen in the UAs in the one D and D UAs is that they've gotten rid of so many dead levels. Yes. With wizards, it yes. used to be just feature dead level, feature dead level, feature dead level, and now yes, a lot of these in this case are um, spells that you just get, but they are full features. Oh, they, they are full confusing things. Oh, they are very confusing. The only quote-unquote dead levels are 11th, 13th, and 17th. Uh, and at those levels, you are getting a new level of spell slot at 6th, 7th, and 9th. So, you're still getting some big improvements to your wizard at those levels still. Finally, the last the last fucking things. Oh, God. oh gosh, there's the rules glossary after this. Uh, we're we're going to gloss over that. But the Evoker yes. is the new subclass. Sam, you are no longer a school of ev- evocation. Wizard, no. You're now an Evoker. You're now an Evoker. Uh, is the new naming convention for the wizard subclasses, which is to name the type of wizard rather than the type or school of magic. <laughs> which, you know... <laughs> You've made fun of quite a bit. I've made fun of quite a bit. Uh, evocation Savant now adds two evocation spells of your choice to your spell book in addition to reducing the cost. So now the evocation wizard is going to learn more evocation shit. A surprising thing that we even needed to say. <laughs> that was uh, honestly one of my big problems with all, diff- all the different subclasses, at least in the 2014 player's handbook, is uh, they're not really different. They're just take the school of magic and insert it in and copy paste it into find all and replace. That's what I mean. That's yeah. For a lot of the features. So yeah. Uh, third level, you also get sculpt spells. When you cast an evocation spell that affects other creatures that you can see, you can choose a number of them equal to one plus the spell's level. The chosen creatures automatically succeed their saving throws against the spell, and they take no damage if they would normally take half damage. Careful spell, but for your evocation spells. There you go. Uh, sixth level. You now get Potent Cantrip, which now works with cantrips with an attack roll and not just saving throws. Your damaging cantrips affect even creatures that avoid the brunt of the effect. When you cast a cantrip, add a creature that and miss with an attack roll, or the creature or the target succeeds on a saving throw against the cantrip, the target takes half of the cantrip's damage, if any, but suffers no additional effects from the cantrip. It really takes the sting off missing with a firebolt. Yeah. It does. Now there's ah, just ah. Li- now the, now there's just now it's just a tickle instead of a bolt. Yeah. Of fire. And then of course tenth level empowered evocation. When you cast an evocation spell with the arcane spell list, you can add your intelligence modifier to the damage. And then of course of course fourteenth level is over channel. It's the same. You're dealing. You're you. You can upcast without actually upcasting, and then you take damage. It's it's the same as it was before. Final thoughts on the wizard. Uh, I'm. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> I I would love to. I, I this is one of those that I'd have to sit down and go through, and probably play the full campaign before I've decided on my my opinions on yeah. these modify and and create spells in a playtest environment. If you were going to do like a one shot, like we would like to do, definitely converse with the person who's playing the wizard and see if they have any spells that they want to have previously modified, scribed, and created. Yeah. Um, or I guess in, in order, modify, created, and scribed. Yes. In the order that they would be used, not the order you get them. But. Yeah, but just to, because there, one, there are so many spells that you could have, that you could modify, and then create, and then scribe, that uh, depending on your play style, depending on the campaign that you're in, mm-hmm. this could have a lot of versatility, and this could have a lot of cool things you could do. Yeah. Finally, 
At long last, we come to the rules glossary. This will go quickly. Uh, change log for the rules glossary. Uh, there's a list of entries that have been added, revised, removed since the previous Unearth Arcana. If an entry is removed from the glossary, that entry is not moving forward in the playtest. Please use the relevant rule for the 2014 Player's Handbook instead of the removed entry. The removed entries are changes to the artisan's tools, the dying condition, the exhausted condition, the gaming set tool, and the musical instrument tool. So all of those have been removed. They have now been reverted back to 2014. The new and revised entries, there are only three. Death saving throws replaces the dying condition that appeared in the previous UA. The influence action, it clarifies that the DM drives both the use and the DCs of this action. Why does it need to be an action? We've railed against the, inf the influence action before. I think it is bad to have it actively. Yeah. True Sight clarifies the appearance of visual illusions to the creature with true sight. Other than that, there are no changes in the rules glossary, which means we can wrap up our section of the first part of the podcast at, let's see. Two hours? Hour 58. <laughs> One hour and 58 minutes. What do you think of the player's handbook playtest number five? Playtest number five, I think, uh, has a lot of positive... Um, changes to it, especially in those first couple of classes, we see uh, the barbarian, the fighter, and the sorcerer. Um, and compare compared to the ones we've uh, previous playtests, namely the druid and paladin playtest, um, I there's just so much to look at here that the fact that we now have the ability to actually go sit down and play. Oh my gosh! Yes, we can actually play test. We can create characters. We can create several different types of characters. Pretty much all of the classes except, I think it's just the monk and the bard? No, the bard was an expert. Bard. Yeah. I think it's just, the, it just monk. the monk. Let's see. Bard, barbarian, fighter, cleric, druid, monk is not, paladin, ranger, warlock, sorcerer, wizard, rogue, rogue, uh, yeah, we're yeah. just missing the monk at this missing point. Missing the monk, and they're not doing the artificer because that, not. Not the, that was the Tasha thing. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we have the ability to play all of the classes except the monk now, and uh, they, we can actually see what it's like to play yep. the game. We have all the we have all the uh, the spell lists available, all the changes to specific spells that have been made. Uh, thankfully, you can only you only need to reference the rules glossary for this most recent play test for rules changes, whereas everything else is defaulted to the 2014 Player's Handbook version. So that's useful as well. <sighs> At long last, let's move on from Dungeons & Dragons, and let's talk about Magic the Gathering, because uh, Magic has had the... Uh, Magic Con in Minneapolis, where they showed off a lot of stuff in the preview panel. This is a Twitter thread that I'm going to be referencing from uh, Wizards underscore Magic, Mag the official Magic the Gathering account. We got a lot of things to go through for upcoming Magic products. First off, Magic the Gathering, Universes Beyond, Doctor Who. Sam, you like the Doctor I Who. I do enjoy Doctor Who. Who is the Doctor? That's the question. Good. It is going to have four... <laughs> Four pre-constructed commander decks in the Doctor Who universe, each with 50 new cards. Are each of them going to have 50 new cards from each other? It's probably 50 new cards total across all four, would yeah. be my guess. Yeah, I, I don't see them create... I mean, they could create 200 new cards for this product. We saw a lot of new cards from uh, the Warhammer universes beyond, but we'll have to see. Yes. We'll have to see. The first deck that they show is Blast from the Past. It's a deck that goes through the storied history of the franchise, and it features the first eight Doctors in Doctor Who. It is going to be blue, white, and green in the colors, and they showed off some art, no cards, but they showed off art for the fourth Doctor, asking, would you like a jelly baby? And then uh, Sarah Jane Smith going on a little adventure. Uh, and they are also going to introduce a new... Com uh, a new mechanic called Doctor's Companion, which allows you to have two commanders if the other is a doctor. The design team felt it only right that we highlight the dynamic duos so prevalent in the show. This seems you can have a second commander if one of them is the doctor. 
what I assume this is going to be is like friends forever or yeah. partnered or partner. More it's going to be partner with. We, uh, that's what I assume it's going to be. Again, we don't know. Partner with. Partner with. So it's going to have like Sarah Jane uh, Smith partner with a doctor. Yes. The fourth doctor, seemingly, in this case, would be, oh, I guess. The fourth it's... doctor, but... With, with Sarah Jane Smith. With as... Sarah, Sarah Jane Smith can have any of the doctors. Interesting. Hypothetically, we're going to yeah. get all 15. Okay. 16? It seem, well, I forget how many we have right now. Seemingly. Uh, Tiny Wimey will show the 10th Doctor and Rose on the front of the packaging. The deck also features Doctors 9, 10, and 11. It is going to be white, red, blue. Uh, and they show off uh, the 10th Doctor with his iconic screwdriver. Uh, David Tennant. Yes. Uh, Paradox Power is going to feature the 13th Doctor with Yasmin Khan, as well as the 12th Doctor. It's going to be red, blue, green. And... Uh, Showed off a, a, a picture of the 13th Doctor. Cool. Uh, and then, as promised, the Masters of Evil Ooh. has incarnations of the Masters, Daleks, and Cybermen, and will have surely a few more infamous faces. It is going to be red, black, blue. And then it showed some art um, of Davros, creator of the Daleks. And then, of course, it showed some landscapes that you see in the TARDIS in their basic lands, uh, as well as Bad Wolf art. Yes. Bad Wolf was a, a recurring theme uh, for the Ninth and Tenth Doctors. Uh, it is in a vertical format of art, so I don't know how they're going to incorporate that. And then uh, they also showed a plane chase card. Uh, the Lux. Oh, that's right. They do more plane chase. Yes. Uh, the TARDIS jumping between worlds made it clear from the start that plane chase had to feature as part of these decks. Here's a new look at the Lux Foundation Library. Is the plane the library? Uh, players have no maximum hand size. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. Whenever chaos ensues, a shadow put a shadow counter on target creature. A creature with a shadow can block and a. A creature with shadow can block or be blocked only by creatures with a shadow. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. And then, of course, we see they're going to have some collector boosters. Uh, showed off a little bit more art of the 13th Doctor's TARDIS showcase art. Uh, and then showed off some important dates. First look is going to be July 28th, shortly before Gen Con. So we'll probably be able to see some cool stuff there at Gen Con. Uh, October 8th is going, or October 3rd is going to be the debut. And then October 13th is going to be the official launch. First look is going to happen at Magic Con Barcelona. Barcelona. What do you think about about the Doctor Who? This is more your thing. I don't really give a shit about this. So. Uh, I mean, this sounds cool to me. And like, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the new generation being... Uh, starting with 9, 10, and 11, I kind of fell off after that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's probably the one I'll... I'll, I'll probably get the one that, uh, has, again, cost... Cost, cost non notwithstanding. Yes. If they're, if they're like, $30 commander decks, I could see you getting all four, honestly. Maybe. They but won't. If they're, if they're, they won't be. <laughs> if they're going in the, the way... If they're $60, I'll probably get one. If they're going in the way of, like, the Commander Masters ones, uh, probably not going to get any of them. Yeah. I don't think they'll I'll be Commanders. Buy yeah. I don't think they'll be Commander Master prices. That's what I hope. My God. Yeah. All right. We also get a little bit of art shown from Wilds of Eldraine. Uh, a new face on Eldraine is Areti, the Charmed Apple. We see some art of her being all evil and holding an apple and having a mirror behind her that makes her look like a hag. So that's cool. Uh, not a preview, but in March of the Machines, the Wicked Slumber Instant card, it's in blue, uh, apparently showed depictions of how Eldraine defeated their Phyrexian invaders. Uh, cool. Uh, Will, Scion of Peace, has risen to fill the role of leading the people of Eldraine after the death of his parents. Uh, the siblings disagree on how to go about helping their homeworld heal. Will rises to be the unifying force while Rowan is after power, believing with enough she'll be able to help fix her home. And then, of course, Nightmares Made Manifest with Ashiok being shown off. And then Sir Ginger has a mount as a little gingerbread horse, which is pretty cool. Uh, they show the lineup of all of the... Uh, of all of the products available, draft set boosters, collector boosters, pre-release kits, bundles, and two commander precons. The first one being Virtue and Valor, 
which is going to be Selesnia, which is green, white, and then Fey Dominion, which is Demir, going to be blue, black. And Blake announced that the, quote, universes within versions of the Walking Dead cards are going to be included in the list for the Wilds of Eldraine. Oh, import- that's interesting. Yes, they finally are doing that. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then the important dates we're going to get first look on July 28th, the same time as the Doctor Who cards. Debut and previews begin August 15th. Pre-release is September 1st to 7th. Digital launch on MTG Arena is September 5th, and then global launch on September 8th. Anything to say about Wilds of Eldraine? You know... No, I don't. It's one of those. It's one of those things where it's... There's so many sets coming out. There's so many products for Magic the Gathering. Mm-hmm. And well, Drain, while it seems cool, I like I like some of the stuff they're talking about. I feel like it's going to slip it's, beneath the yeah. radar with, you know, well, Lord of the Rings coming out. And yeah. with Commander Masters coming out. And with the fact that we just had just finished a giant story arc and then had a, a micro set. Yeah, this... this it's going to set up some it's going to set up some interesting stories i guess if you're into the lore we're not super into the magic the gathering lore uh but especially given the products that are going to surround it i think Mm. absolutely it's going to be lost um the next thing that that wizards announced was that uh mtg arena is going to be available for steam libraries uh, starting May 23rd, and it will continue to have crossplay if that is your thing. Uh, if you are into competitive magic, the Arena Championship, the prize pool is going to be $200,000, and uh, it's going to be starting Saturday, May 27th, and May 28th, uh, going to be in Las Vegas, 2023 World Championships. March of the Machine Draft and Standard. Going to be what's played there, so neat. And now we get on to Commander Masters. They showed off the commanders for all of the decks. First up, for the Eldrazi deck, we have Zoladok Void Gorger. It is going to be five and a colorless mana, specifically. With colorless spells you cast from your hand with mana value seven or greater, have Cascade, Cascade. So this deck is going to want you to cast big spells. Mm hmm. And then double cascade with them to get mm-hmm. other big spells. Yeah. It's fucked. It's also 7-4, Eldrazi. Yeah. It, it, oh, that's what Eldrazi do. They, they Eldrazi all over the place. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are already trying to break that, which I'm kind of into. I feel like it's very easy to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Abzan, low-key one of my favorite trios of color combinations, white, black, green. We get the Enchantress, Anixia, Hand of Erebos. This is Theros. I'm a fan of Theros. It is a legendary enchantment creature demigod that is a 4-4 for two white, black, green. It has menace and other enchantment creatures you control have menace. Also, whenever Anixa enters the battlefield or attacks, exile up to one target non-aura enchantment card from your graveyard. Create a token that's a copy of that card, except it is a 3-3 black zombie creature in addition to its other types. So all of your... All of your enchantment staples, your enchantment creatures, can now be reanimated mm-hmm. as creatures. That will also now have menace because of her passive ability to give all enchantment creatures menace. And all of your other enchantments. Yep. Guess what? You got rid of my smothering tide? Here it is as a zombie. Here it is as a zombie Guess with what? menace. You got rid of my uh, my uh, oh my ghostly prison? Here it is as a zombie with menace. Yeah. I think this is a lot of fun. This is... I'm already into the enchantress stuff and they're probably you're probably going to get i wouldn't be surprised if you get a reprint of set this harvest hand mm. or, or or any of the other really good enchantress card draw cards so that'll be really cool uh next we have oh boy <sighs> it's a planeswalker commodore guff in the lore supposedly a the writer of the multiverse and his abilities don't really reflect that <laughs> uh is a planeswalker for one blue red white It is a starting five loyalty. Static ability of, at the beginning of your end step, put a loyalty counter on another target planeswalker you control. It has a plus one for create a 1-1 red wizard creature token with tap to add red mana. Spend this mana only to cast a planeswalker spell. It has minus three to draw X cards, and Commodore Guff deals X damage to each opponent where X is the number of planeswalkers you control. Kind of underwhelming, especially for the supposed writer of the multiverse. Yeah. It's got some cool art. It's got cool art, and the thing with a with a with a super friends deck, as this is colloquially known, um, 
you're going to have a lot of abilities. And the fact that your commander's abilities are kind of... He's he's just copying some other abilities that we yeah. see on other planeswalkers. Like, okay, okay, the you know his static is isn't is good for a planeswalker deck, but the other two you kind of hope would be better. Yeah, I the he what? doesn't even have an ultimate. Yeah, he doesn't. It's it's one of those. Uh, I don't know. I he could he could have been a lot more powerful. I'm I'm skeptical of that deck. At last we have the sliver deck. <laughs> Slivers. You've heard Queen, you've heard Overlord, you've heard Legion, you've heard Li- Hive Lord. Now you have Sliver Grave Mother. For Wooburg, which is one of every color, you get a 6 6 legendary creature Sliver. The legend rule doesn't apply to Slivers you control. Each Sliver creature card in your graveyard has Encore X, where X is its mana value. Sliver Grave Mother has Encore 5. Encore, for those of you that don't know, you pay the cost, exile this card from your graveyard, for each opponent, create a token copy that attacks that opponent this turn if able they gain haste sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step activate only as a sorcery do you want three queen slivers do you want three overlord slivers do you want three legion slivers or hive lord slivers or first slivers you can get three of them they're not going to die to legend rule nope we'll die when you have to sacrifice them but but for that's that's gonna be you set up and then you pop, you, yeah. You sliver all over the place. Oh, and and any any of your slivers are going to be able to pop back in at any point. So they finally get rid of one of your major sliver pieces. You can get them back. You get three of them. You get to swing all of them at each of your opponents, and then they'll go away. Yeah. So slivers already have an annoying their annoying feature of every other sliver has this. Oh yeah. And now uh, now it's even it's gonna be even more fun. Yeah. Also. So we also get the art of the actual Commander Masters boxes for the Commander's decks. But uh, there are cards that are not in the four decks and are only found in Commander Masters boosters. First up, one not seen since Portal is Personal Tutor with some Strixhaven flavor. Personal Tutor is a one mana sorcery, or a one blue mana for a sorcery, where you search your library for a sorcery card, reveal it, then shuffle your library and put that card on top. Another tutor effect. Probably not going to be a very expensive one because it only tutors up sorceries, but there's a lot of great sorceries that you might want to tutor up. That's true. Next, a well-known and well-beloved Green Ramp commander in Selvala Heart of the Wilds. Selvala Heart of the Wilds is one green green for a 2-3 legendary elf scout. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield, its controller may draw a card if its power is greater than each other creature's power. You can also pay a green mana and tap it to add X mana in any combination of colors where X is the greatest power among creatures you control. A perfectly fine commander for a mono green deck that wants to cast really big things. That's Commander Masters. Real quick, I do have the Amazon page pulled up for it right now. Oh, for fuck's for sake! For some pricings, because we already knew we have when when they first announced this product, we know that we knew that it was going to have some ridiculous prices. Um, right now on Amazon, pre-order prices for uh, we'll just give some the Enduring Enchantments deck is eighty four thirty seven. Fuck's sake! Um, the for all th- if you want all four decks you can get them for three hundred forty two dollars pre order. <laughs> a dra- <laughs> this is ludicrous. A draft booster box, uh, which is twenty four packs of four hundred eighty cards, is three hundred forty nine dollars. Uh, sidebar, sidebar. Why are they doing draft boosters for a set that is designed for commander? I don't know. That's Why? beyond me. That's 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 a dumb thing to do. I bet the draft. The draft environment is not going to be very good for this this set. Especially if it's supposed to be a bunch of powerful, like, you know, relic cards. Yeah. Like uh, anyway, the uh, booster box, 24 packs of 360 magic cards, $480. And uh, the collector's booster at this time is four packs for 60 cards is $250. That is the only one that's, like, relatively normal. Fuck that. By singles. Straight up. By singles. And then lastly, the thing that we're really all here for. At least I am. Uh, Magic the Gathering Universes Beyond. Lord of the Rings. Tales of Middle Earth. We get a couple more previews of things. Call of the Ring is a one and a black mana enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep, the ring tempts you. 
Whenever you choose a creature as your ring bearer, you may pay two life. If you do, draw a card. Whenever the ring tempts you, you must pick a creature as your ring bearer. So this is basically for Rexian Arena. Hmm. Pay two life, draw a card. With the benefit of the ring bearing. The ring is an emblem that you are going to get. We now know what it means when it says the ring tempts you. It is going to be a two-sided token, or I assume it's going to be a token that they include in probably okay. most of the packs. Probably like the, the day-night token that they include in most yes. of the werewolf packs. Yes. The ring tempts you. As the ring tempts you, you get an emblem named the ring if you don't have one. Then your emblem gains its next ability and you choose a creature you control to become or remain your king, your ring bearer, your king bearer, your ring bearer. The rules are the ring can tempt you even if you don't control a creature. The ring gains its abilities in order from top to bottom. Once it gains an ability, it has that ability for the rest of the game. Each time the ring tempts you, you must choose a creature you control if you control one. Each player can have only one emblem named the ring and only one ring bearer at a time. Oh, There are four abilities associated with the ring. The first ability, your ring bearer is legendary and can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. In a non-commander format, then we, we discussed if, they, if that means they would be legend ruled. But if a legendary creature with one name enter, is on the battlefield and then you play a non-legendary creature with that same name... I don't think the legend rule even applies. So it's weird Correct. that they it become... It has to be a legendary... Uh, both both copies would have to be a legendary creature. Yeah. So it's weird that it makes it legendary. But, I mean... I think it's just flavor. Flavor wins. Flavor wins. Uh, but it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. That makes some of the cards that we've already seen, like the, the Frodo card that, like, levels up itself. Yeah. And then, like, Gollum, the one power creatures, that makes them much more powerful when they are the ring bearer, yep. which I think is kind of the point. <laughs> uh, the second ability is whenever your ring bearer attacks, draw a card, then discard a card. Every time, you, every time your ring bearer attacks, you loot. It's going to be attacked and likely going to be unblockable by most, at least by one of the players if you're playing commander. Yeah. The third ability. Whenever your ring bearer becomes blocked by a creature, that creature's controller sacrifices it at the end of combat. This is different than Death Touch. Yes. Because Death Touch says, says that if, they take da- if the death touching creature damages the other creature, that creature is destroyed. Which but, indestructible creatures cannot be destroyed. Correct, but this is an edict effect where it's affecting the target player yes. to having to cause to sacrifice their own creature. Yes. So this is going to bypass indestructible. If 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 they manage to block your ring bearer, whatever they are blocking with is gone into the graveyard. Period. Of course, there's a there's a chance there'll be a jump blocker anyway. Chance, um, chances are, but one, that's one a soldier, nice, get him. <laughs> that's a nice bit of utility. True. True. And then the last ability is the fourth level ability. Whenever your ring bearer deals combat damage to a player, each opponent loses three life. Fine. Command, commander oriented for sure. And a fine ability. All four of these abilities do not have a downside. People are very upset that the one ring does not have a downside. Their justification for that has been, well, when you played it with a downside, people would not play cards that tempted them and if they did, they would not want to have the one ring, and they don't use the one ring abilities. Mm-hmm. So we're going to not give them a downside so that you use the abilities. Yeah. I'm okay with that. It's it's one of those things, like we were going, if we went back to earlier in the podcast, when we were talking about the Barbarian, the reason people didn't use, uh, you know, would be, we might not use the bad abilities, or the abilities that were strong, but damaged you, was because, while they were strong, they damaged you. Yeah. This is the same idea. And if Magic had a more historic... Um, a more historic for every upside there's a downside for, sort of build which some games do yeah not this one it's yeah. hard to introduce a, a a good for bad when you don't have a history of that yeah it's, the good has to be really fucking good and the bad has to be not that bad mm-hmm. which at that point it's like why are you even bothering the last new card that they showed is Sauron the Necromancer which the art on it is just I'm into it sexually. No. Oh. It is a three black black for a four four legendary creature avatar horror with menace. And whenever Sauron the Necromancer attacks, exile target creature card from your graveyard. Create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of that card, except it's a three three black wraith with menace. 
At the beginning of your next end step, exile that token unless Sauron is your ring bearer. Unless Sauron is your ring bearer. That is a flavorful win. I agree. Sauron being your ring bearer, you can now keep your token copies with menace that you are pulling from your own graveyard. Holy reanimator. Your your legendaries <laughs> that you that you yes. pull back from the graveyard and turn into wraiths. Yes. That's a lot of fun. That is fucking awesome. The idea of Sauron being your ring bearer, creating their nine ring wraiths from people that have fucking died in your graveyard. Also, that ability is fucking good. <laughs> You're getting a 3-3 three, three token copy with menace of any creature in your graveyard. Mm-hmm. So cool. I think the only way this could have been more of a flavor win is if it was a target creature card from any graveyard. Yeah, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. Probably a little bit too powerful at that point, but really I, fucking cool. I mean, with those kind of decks, even even if it did say from anyone's graveyard, it's still kind of like, do you, do you sit there and rely on your opponents to have cool things in their graveyard? Yeah. It's also, it's just one of those nice, nice to haves. It's like, oh, this card has been a pain in the ass for the fucking table and someone finally removed it. Now I get it. Yeah. I you mean, know? if you really want that effect, there are some of those effects out there. And it, but at the same time. It would play more into the flavor of, like, Sauron corrupting True. the people to his side kind of thing. That would have been cool. But even as is, that's a fucking awesome card. Elves, an Elves deck, a Dwarves deck, a Humans deck versus Sauron the Necromancer deck. That'd be so cool. I can't wait for this fucking set. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm like... You're jittery. I'm quivering with excitement. I like that verb. Uh... Last two things. We'll go through these very quickly. Uh, plan to attend Magic Celebration event at your local game store from July 7th to 9th, and it uses Lord of the Rings art. So, cool. Lord of the Rings things that, that week. Uh, that weekend. Uh, Magic Carm Barcelona is happening at the end of May. Uh, you can get badges uh, the day after this podcast goes live, and it's at the end of July. And then finally. One last thing, guys. One, one last thing. Just one more. It's going to be quick, I promise. Um... Magic the Gathering is revitalizing standard. They are changing the rotation for the standard format. Starting with the current standard environment, sets will rotate out every three years rather than every two years. So the current sets that were set to rotate would have been Innistrad, Crimson Vow, Innistrad, Midnight Hunt, Kamigawa, Neon Neon Dynasty, and the Streets of New Capenna are going to remain in standard until they would normally rotate out of standard in 2024. Or they would normally rotate in 2023, right about, like, with the release of Wilds of Eldraine. Now they're going to rotate with the set that releases at the beginning of next fall in 2024. So cards are going to remain in standard for longer. Their methodology for this is, is, quote, it will give current standard cards more longevity. It will allow mechanics and archetypes to be more effectively built on over time. And it is going to give stronger tools to create an environment where decks are more, quote, colors and mechanic, like green-white toxic or blue-white soldiers, and less mid-range. Specifically, Grixis mid-range, which dominates like half of all standard decks. And their win rate is by far the highest. Um... They want to give it more. They want to give standard more stability, vitality, and then strengthen it for local game stores because local game stores aren't playing standard very much. Um, does this solve that pro- any of those problems? It gives the cards more longevity, sure. It gives them more flexibility to build out archetypes over time, sure. Doesn't really solve the problem unless they ban more cards, which is not going to be very good for standard. It's also a thing of like. All right, what's the reason, you know, I mean, is this, uh, maybe they did a survey that we didn't see, and they and they did ask people, why aren't you playing standard anymore? And maybe these were the answers, but, you know, I maybe the reason is. is just that there's a million different, you know, formats these days, and obviously Commander has one of the highest populations anymore. Um, then there's also Pioneer, there's Modern, there's Popper, there's now different forms of, of EDH as well as Command of of. You know, between Popper EDH and yeah. CDH and Oathbreaker just became an official format. There's Legacy. There's all of these different ones. You know, it's interesting that they've that they're interested in revitalizing standard in particular. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it. Standard is like, it's it's, it's the, the best. Standard. It's the yes. <laughs> it's it's the format that gets brand new players in. Yeah, they have. You want to buy the most recent cards? Okay, you can play the most recent cards, and you're going to be playing against the most recent cards. Mm-hmm. Now it's going to be 
the most recent cards and some cards that have been around for a while. And you're still going to have the problem of all these fucking mid-range decks that don't really commit to a mechanic or a strategy that they've been designing around. So, I don't know. I don't think it solves the problem. I I don't play standard, so, you know. I only play a little bit on arenas, and from what I've been seeing from other people that do play standard more consistently, they're, they're like, this seems very unnecessary, and it's just going to lead to more cards being banned. That's fair. Well, Sam, we are almost two and a half hours into this podcast it is time as we always do for me to ramble off a little bit while sam looks at uh comments because at the end of the show we like to answer questions comments concerns thoughts and or ideas from both our discord server as well as the tiktok live chat where uh, you can watch this podcast where we record it live the day before it goes live on tuesdays every other week Uh, this podcast can be found on apple google spotify youtube microwave ovens all of the same samuel what does the TikTok live chat have to say? Way back at the beginning, Jose Maxira says, Guys, I played MTG in my country like 15 years ago. Pretty competitive player. How should I start? I assume get back in. Uh, Magic Arena, because it's free, and you can get a lot of cards for free, and you can relearn you can relearn how to play, for one, and uh, get uh, some exposure to what the new mechanics are and the new types of cards are. That's what I would do. And then work your way back into paper when you can, where, where you'll actually be spending money, when you are a bit more knowledgeable of the current magic environment. All right. This is an interesting question. Uh, again, a while ago. It's from Off the Cuff Tom. Thoughts on characters, I assume, I, uh, thoughts on players who want to make characters with a unique backstory that's outside of lore. Hmm. For D&D, outside of lore. So this is actually an interesting question that I kind of had a, 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 not back and forth, but like I kind of responded to like a, a good six months ago from a creator who played a lot of Pathfinder. In Pathfinder, all the stories happen in the same world. Like they're all, there's one setting. The world is the setting as far as I'm aware, understand. And uh, his question was back then, very similar. What, what happens, how in D&D do you, you know, um, um, balance the fact if if the players want to go somewhere else that's not there like where why, what if they want to go to Strixhaven and, yeah. and they're in a, uh, a Dragonlance campaign and my kind of response there was um, the lore of D&D is, is they have made so many lores that at this point I think they more expect people just to do their own setting and to draw on influences from these different things but if you're going to play in a Dragonlance campaign that's because you and your players have agreed that you want to play in a Dragonlance campaign and that means the players probably want to build characters that are Dragonlance characters if they want to build Strixhaven characters then they would have talked to you about can we do Strixhaven exactly so I think if if you are very if you ha- if you have presented it to your players that you want to play in this certain setting then the, you should have buy-in from everybody that they're going to be in this setting. On the other hand, if you're brewing your own homebrew world, there's no reason that you can't have your players work with you collaboratively to build in this thing that they want to do. Yeah, I agree. That's a, that's a very good answer. You should do the, that thing that you're doing. You should vamp. The vamp? vamp. The vamping thing. Well, oh, merch. We ha- we talked about this at the top of the show. We have merch. You can check the link in Linktree in the bio. It should be the first link. We also have an Amazon affiliate store where you can get any of the products that we use for our live streams when we play Magic the Gathering, as well as products that we use uh, while playing D&D. Uh, we do get a small commission on those. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, on, on Instagram. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. Sam does a lot of cool shorts over there. Uh, I've always wanted to play D&D. It's hard to learn. It's always a good question to answer. Yes and no. It's again. It depends on who you are playing with, how they like to play, what class you decide to play, what character you decide to make. If you want to, uh, if you're a brand new player, you've never played D and D before, and you were like, "I really want to be a warlock," that's probably not going to be a very good learning experience for you. Because there's a lot of shit that you need to do as a warlock to build your character. If you're like, I just want to run up and swing a sword and fight some things. Oh, yeah, you can be- you can build a fighter in like 10 minutes. 
And it's going to be a lot easier to get through the character building process because that is the big barrier in my mind to D&D for new people is the character creation process. Mm -hmm. Actually playing the game, you can kind of do it on the fly and learn the rules as they come up in a lot of ways. All you need to be primed with is most of your rolls are going to be with this shiny math rock that is a D20. And then you're good to go for the most part. Um, a little extension of that, Allie Pickard asks, have any any hacks for someone who's going to play for the first time and completely in over their head? I think it actually, when uh, mentioned to them, of the shiny math rocks, um, first off, if you're, hopefully you have a good DM who's willing to help explain things and or, you know, very much just say, roll this. Having different color dice. Yes. If you can, if you can, you know, either pick up some from some from friends from some friends or buy multiple sets. Have each die be a different color. So when it says, "All right, roll," you know, roll me a dexterity saving throw. That's going to be the red one. Saving throw. Saving throws are red. Attacks are blue. Your damage is purple. That kind of stuff. Um, other than that, just you know, watch some uh, watch some some YouTube shorts by the Dungeon Bros. Yes. Also, uh, check out. Check out some D and D life plays. That's also a good spot. Oh boy, we have a lot of comments right now, guys. There's there's some good conversation happening. Uh, We've also been going for two and a half hours at that, this point. I think this might be, if not the longest podcast we've done, it's certainly in the top three. Certainly so in the top three. It's an interesting one. What's something you'd love to see? On an online shop from a brick and mortar game store. Oh, from an on on an online shop from a brick and mortar game store. Um, huh. Certainly, like little little tchotchkes and little accessories for gaming, I think is a good thing for online because. If you're going to be buying a full on game, at a game store. Like a board, let's say for example a board game or like your rule books for D and D. You're probably going to your local game store for that, True. or you're just going to get it on Amazon. If you're going to have your own online shop as a local game store, then you're going to need something that is unique that stands out that might be able to be shared on social media, maybe go a little bit viral. So like a little more esoteric things. Uh, and then if you're if you sell cards for trading card games, then you probably should have a good selection of singles available. Um, okay, here we go. Keenan Perry, uh, back to the spell points video. When we mentioned spell points video, yes. have you played with spell points? Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I have a Hexblade Warlock uh, for a campaign that our friend Darren was running. Uh, we haven't really played it in a while, but I replaced Pact Magic with the use of spell points. And it allowed me to do things like I can cast Shield without feeling like I'm wasting a third level spell slot. And I still have spell points available to cast uh, Hex. I can, ca I can still cast my higher level spells that I have access to that I like as a Hexblade. So, you know. I think it's I, it's the way I would play a warlock if I were to play a 5e warlock. If I'm playing a 1D&D &D warlock, probably not. Um, I play in a Star Wars 5th edition SW5e campaign, and all spellcasters and uh, use spell points. Um, it really simplifies things down, man. Like, not, really? Yeah. Like, I just know I have 33 spell points to work with. I have, here are my, here are my spells. If I need to cast, you know... If I need to cast my you know, my my counter spell equivalent, every, for every you know if I even need to use every one of these spell slots in order to save my party, I can. Yeah, that's the main thing is that if you need if you just need six third level spell slots, you can use six third level spell slots. Uh, let's see. Or whatever level that you are capable of making. I don't think six actually works out with the number of spell points you get, but I digress. Math is hard. Uh, Anthony. Spiropolis says feelings on them reverting exhaustion. I think it's fine. Uh, the 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 newer the newer the newer exhaustion they were going with was a ten point system instead of a six point system, and it was going to be just a flat minus one minus two minus for every point of exhaustion you have. Um, I I think the old way of exhaustion was fine. I just think they had too many things that gave exhaustion too easily. Mm. I think if they wanted to give exhaustion more easily, then they should have kept the new system. But if they want to keep exhaustion to be a more extreme punishment... Which I think it should be. It should be. That's fine. Hey. 
Um, they could also just make something new. They could take that exhaustion table they had and just make it something new. Yeah. Just change. Yeah. I think I think six levels of exhaustion. Dying at ten is fine. But once you once you hit like three levels of exhaustion, you're spiraling very quickly down mm-hmm. to six. Mm-hmm. So I think maybe making six six level dead first first level exhaustion the same maybe shift it so that it's more deadly at like five and six instead of at like three mm-hmm. um landon rodriguez asks are the 40 com- or the 40k commander decks worth it so i got the necrons deck back when it came out and it was 60 dollars. it is well worth 60 dollars. i've since broken it up and it goes into any of my reanimator decks which i or or my reanimator or artifact decks which i seem to just continuously build um if you if they if they're still at one point they were like two hundred dollars not worth that no just buy the singles you need honestly they're they're very good they're a bunch of brand new card designs they're very good card designs they're really cool art buy singles yeah <laughs> I would never buy a commander precon that is more than sixty dollars period and even that's probably too expensive try to find it in the 40 to 50 dollar range there's so many good pre-cons you can get that have been out for a while that you can find in a cheaper range like that um sweet potato check mark says what's the most surprising chaotic thing that's ever happened you had happened in a game um I remember that I remembered something from my homebrew campaign from forever ago, but I can't remember the specifics of it. Oh wow! Well, there was a there was a hilar- there was a hilarious bath or a bath house scene moment that was funny. Um, wow! I'm gonna. I'll- oh my gosh, that's right. It was the it was the I'm I want to go to the brothel. All right, female rogue. Why? Uh, I want to find who, like, what's going on there? I'm like, all right, uh, there's a gnome there. She's like, gnome, that must mean child. I'm like, no, it's an adult, but it, sure, it looks young. I'm just trying to roll with it. And she, <laughs> this gnome was like, go had to go into the rooms afterwards to clean up after things were happening. And uh, she hate, the, the character hated it so much that she went to a magic item shop Managed to, on an amazing sleight of hand and deception checks, get him to drink a a, a, a <laughs> drink some wine that was spiked with a love potion, got him to write a contract to produce magic items for the brothel that were like auto cleaning mops and buckets and shit so that this gnome wouldn't have to clean up a, a, a post sex work mess anymore. That was the most chaotic thing that ever happened in a campaign. And I feel like I've brought that up on the podcast before. Possibly. Um, not necessarily super chaotic, but uh, I found it very funny at the time. It was the first game you and I ever played in together. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was the first session. Uh, only like, well, first session that you were in. But we were only like level four. And you're yet you a rogue, I believe. Yes, I was a rogue. Who was doing some roguey things and trying to steal from the ranger's room. Yeah. Anyway, the ranger catches the rogue stealing from the ranger's room, or attempting to, uh, and so the rogue, you, decides to flee out the window. Um, (laughs) That's right. Meanwhile, uh, my character, who is a fighter training a kobold to be his squire, is out in the alley doing drills, and all of a sudden, due to two bad rolls, from three, I think it was like three stories up, near splat. There's a rogue on the ground. What the? Two seconds later, new splat from really bad rolls. The ranger falls right next to him. Yeah, that was funny. I was I was, I was trying to get into that room uh, because I, the ranger's wolf was in there, and I was trying to get the wolf to like me. So I was like putting like bacon under the under the door and trying to get animal handling up. And the ranger's like, "What the fuck are you doing?" I'm like, "I just want a puppy friend." <laughs> and then I ran. <laughs> All right. We're two, we're two hours and 40 minutes into this. I'm exhausted, and I'm really hungry, and I want lunch. So, one D&D playtest. It was a lot. It was a lot. Magic the Gathering uh, Magic Con. Also a lot. No, not as much, but still a fair amount. Still a chunky bit. Any, any final thoughts? Um, 
Nah, let's just go. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> All right. We, now, we appreciate everybody who's uh, uh, in the chat right now and who is listening to us on the on all the different platforms. Yes, uh, it has been a joy. As always, you can catch us every other week. Dungeon Rose Podcast on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, all the podcast services around the globe. We love you very much, and as always, peace.